Section 31 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Natter. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. First Partition of Poland, A.D. 1772 by james fletcher part one of the three partitions which poland underwent in the last quarter of the eighteenth century the first was due to the jealousies of european powers it was an event of great significance for the polish kingdom ominous of future spoliations which indeed followed to the destruction of its political life it had been long since poland passed her golden age two centuries and more in the meantime she had undergone many vicissitudes yet had preserved her identity as a state when russia had won successes in the war of seventeen sixty eight to seventeen seventy four with turkey she seized the principalities of wallachia and moldavia austria seeing in this acquisition a menace to her eastern frontier opposed it russia in order to appease austria looked about for territory that might be obtained for her in compensation the state of affairs in Poland presented a tempting opportunity for interference which might lead to a division of the kingdom. Stanislaus II, King of Poland, had been elected in 1764 mainly through the influence of Russia. He was one of Katrina II's lovers. His people had risen against him when Russia adopted her policy of spoliation. Prussia, as well as Austria, advanced territorial claims and the partition of 1772, really planned by Frederick the Great, was consummated on the basis of a secret treaty of those powers with Catherine's government. Some writers, possessed with the love of reducing political transactions to one rigid scale of cause and effect, and at the same time of exhibiting their acumen by threading the mazes of events up to remote circumstances, pretend to trace the design of the partition of Poland far more than a century back. Rullier seems to plume himself on the idea. The projects executed in our days against Poland, he observes, were proposed more than a hundred years ago. I have discovered this important and hitherto unknown circumstance in the archives of foreign affairs of France. This point had been canvassed under the reign of John Casimir, and it only remains to be remarked that such very subtle analysis of the motives and progress of actions generally overshoots the mark, since no man can always act according to rule, but are in some degree influenced by circumstances and caprice. It would be equally absurd to imagine that Frederick, in the complicated intrigues which preceded the first partition, was actuated by one deeply laid scheme of policy to arrive at one end, the possession of Polish Prussia. It was indeed absolutely essential for him to obtain this province, to consolidate and open a communication between his scattered dominions, which then, as Voltaire says, were stretched out like a pair of gaiters. But it remained a desideratum rather than a design, since he knew that neither Russia nor Austria would be inclined to permit the aggression for the former had evidently marked out the whole of Poland for herself, and would consider Frederick an unwelcome intruder, while Austria, which had lately experienced the Prussian king's encroachments, was more jealous than ever of his obtaining the slightest aggrandizement, and had openly declared that she would not allow the seizure of the least Polish village. His views, however, widened as he advanced, and no doubt he spoke with sincerity when he told the Emperor Joseph that he had never followed a plan in war, much less any plan in policy, and that events alone had suggested all his resolutions. Admitting the truth of this, we proceed to trace out the circumstances which produced this crisis. The relations of the three courts at the commencement of the war between Russia and Turkey in 1768 did not portend anything like a coalition. Frederick, indeed, was in alliance with Russia, but also discreetly favoured the Sultan. Austria was all but an open enemy of both Prussia and Russia. Circumstances, however, obliged Austria to forget her hatred to Prussia, 
and Frederick thus became the mediator between the courts of Vienna and St. Petersburg. Frederick had every reason to wish to lull the suspicions and jealousies of Austria that he might be left in undisputed possession of Silesia, and that power, moreover, was no longer an object of dread or jealousy to him, for the Seven Years' War had reduced its resources to the lowest ebb. The dispositions of the court of Vienna cannot be comprised in so few words. Its situation was much more complicated, its policy more embarrassed, and the persons who governed it will be much more difficult to make known. Maria Theresa was now not very far from the tomb, and after all the arduous struggles she had undergone for the defence of her states, vicissitudes she had experienced, and the exhaustion of her resources, she determined to end her days in peace. She devoted almost the whole of her time to superstitious devotions in a gloomy chamber hung round with death's heads, and a portrait of her late husband in the act of expiring. She yet cherished, however, some of the feelings of mortality, implacable hatred to Frederick, and contempt mingled with hate for Catherine II, of whom she never spoke but with disdain, calling her that woman. Besides, she could sometimes also silence the reproaches of conscience, so as to seize for the public use the bequests of the pious for religious purposes, and to confiscate the revenues of rich monasteries, apparently without any compunction. Men fancied, says our author, that they could foresee in all this conduct that if this just and religious princess had power enough over herself to silence her generosity, and even sometimes her piety, she might perhaps be capable in some state crisis of incurring still greater remorse and silence justice. Her minister, Kaunitz, to whom she entrusted all the management of affairs, is not the least important personage in this drama, nor did he underrate his own consequence. Heaven, says he, is a hundred years in forming a great mind for the restoration of an empire, and it then rests another hundred years. On this account I tremble for the fate which awaits this monarchy after me. Throughout a long and arduous ministry he had shown himself the most subtle and refined politician, unfettered in his schemes by any remorse or feeling, and making a boast that he had no friends. Such a man was well fitted to play the part allotted to him. After the conclusion of the long war, he had made it his policy to repair the damages the empire had sustained by alliances, and even his opposition to Frederick daily subsided. But it was another agent who commenced the connection between Austria and Prussia. Joseph, Maria Theresa's son and co-regent with his mother, detested this pacific policy and longed for war. He was, however, obliged to submit, for Maria dreaded the effects of this warlike propensity and kept the government in the hands of her ministers. He had continual contentions with the empress and urged her to improve her finances by conquest or aggression, but all the power he could obtain was the command of the troops, which he augmented to 200,000 men and organized them under the counsel of his field marshal Lacy. In his mania for military matters, he visited, in 1768, all the fields of battle of the last war, and after traversing Bohemia and Saxony, and learning from his generals the causes of the defeats and victories, he approached, in the course of his tour, the borders of Prussian Silesia, where Frederick was engaged in his annual reviews. The king sent a polite message, and expressed a great desire to be personally acquainted with him. The young prince could not pay a visit to the former enemy of his family without previously consulting his mother, the empress, and the interview was deferred till the next year, when it took place on August 25th at Nice, a town in Silesia. At this period the war between Russia and Turkey engrossed general attention, and seems to have formed the principal subject of the conference, but no resolutions of any importance were agreed to. The flattering manner in which Frederick received the young prince must have made a great impression on his mind, and the extravagant compliments which were lavished on him were highly gratifying to youthful vanity from such a great man. Frederick frequently repeated that Joseph would surpass Charles V, 
and though it has the appearance of irony to those acquainted with the denouement of this youthful monarch's character, it was probably not intended so, for Frederick, we have seen before, could stoop to the most servile adulation when it answered his purpose. Be that as it may, the effect on Joseph was the same, for on his return he spoke of the Prussian monarch with the highest enthusiasm. Maria Theresa was growing old, and the Austrian ministers began to turn to the rising sun. The eyes of Kaunitz were opened to the policy of cultivating a friendship with Prussia, and the correspondence between the two courts became every day more frequent. This led to another conference between the two princes at Neustadt, in Moravia, which was held on September 3, 1770, and at which Kaunitz was present. The king was more courteous than ever. He appeared in the military uniform of Austria, and continued to wear it as long as he remained in the Austrian territory. He made use of every species of compliment. One day, as they were leaving the dining room, and the emperor made a motion to give him the precedence, he stepped back, saying, with a significant smile and double entendre, not lost on Joseph, since your imperial majesty begins to maneuver, I must follow wherever you lead. Nor did he spare his civilities to Kaunitz, with the view of removing the rankling feeling which had often made that conceited minister exclaimed, The king of Prussia is the only man who denies me the esteem which is due to me. Kaunitz insisted on the necessity of opposing the ambitious views of Russia, and stated that the empress would never allow Catherine to take possession of Moldavia and Wallachia, which would make her states adjoin those of Austria, nor permit her to penetrate farther into Turkey. He added that an alliance between Austria and Prussia was the only means of checking Catherine's overbearing power. To this Frederick replied that being in alliance with the court of St. Petersburg, his only practicable measure was to prevent the war from becoming general by conciliating the friendly feeling of Catherine towards Austria. On the day after this conference, a courier arrived from Constantinople with the news of the destruction of the Turkish fleet and the rout of their army, and to request the mediation of the courts of Vienna and Berlin. To this both readily assented, but without agreeing upon any terms. Frederick did not forget to follow up his former mode of tactics with the emperor, he pretended to make him the confidant of all his designs, a species of flattery most gratifying to a young prince. On his return to Berlin also the king affected to imitate the Austrian manners, and uttered several pompous panegyrics on the talents of Joseph, who had recited to him some of Tasso's verses, and nearly a whole act of the pastor Fido. Thus did Frederick avail himself of circumstances to commence an amicable correspondence with Austria, and he thus became the medium of communication between the hostile courts of Vienna and St. Petersburg. No more direct intelligence, however, existed between these two states than before, for great as was Teresa's hatred against Catherine, Catherine's was no less violent, and even when Austria made friendly overtures through Frederick, Concerning mediation between Turkey and Russia, she desired Frederick to desist, and rejected the interference. A channel of communication, however, was opened between the three conspiring powers, and the next step was for one of the triumvirate to broach the iniquitous partition plot. It is made a matter of much dispute which of them started the project, and they all equally disclaim the infamy of being its author. The fact, no doubt, was that in this, as in all other unjust coalitions, they did not, in the first instance, act on a preconcerted plan, but each individual power cherished secretly its design, and, like designing villains who understand one another, almost without eyes, ears, or harmful sound of words, the conspiring parties were naturally drawn together by the similarity of reckless atrocity in their designs. It cannot be imagined that the scheme of partition originated with Catherine. She had long been the real mistress of Poland. The king was nothing more than her tenant at will, and it required only a little time for the whole kingdom to sink into a Russian province. The intentions of the other powers began to evince themselves more plainly in 1770. 
Frederick began to throw out hints of claims on certain Polish districts. He obliged the Polish Prussians to furnish his troops with horses and corn in exchange for debased money, which was either forged Polish coin, only one-third of its nominal value, or false Dutch ducats, 17% under the proper value. By this disgraceful species of swindling, it is calculated he gained seven million dollars. The young Poles were enrolled in the armies by force, and every town and village in Poznania was taxed at a stated number of marriageable girls, who were sent to stock the districts of the Prussian dominions depopulated by the long wars. Each girl's portion was to be a bed, two pigs, a cow, and three ducats of gold. It is said that one town alone was obliged to furnish the Prussian general, Belling, with fifty girls. Under pretense that the magistrates of Danzig prevented the levies, troops were marched into the territories of the city, a contribution of one hundred thousand ducats was exacted, and one thousand young men were pressed for the Prussian service. Frederick's military possession of Poznania, as well as the greater part of Polish Prussia, seemed to be but too consonant with his hinted claims, and his arbitrary levies evinced not merely intended but actual possession. Austria, too, was playing a similar part on the south. In the spring of 1769, Bierzyński, at the head of a small troop of confederates, entered Lubowla, one of the towns in the starosty or district of Zips, or Spisch, with the intention of levying contributions, as he was accustomed in a disorderly manner. This little district is situated to the south of the Palatinate of Krakow, among the Carpathian Mountains, and has been originally a portion of the Kingdom of Hungary. The Confederates were followed by the Russians, and took refuge in Hungary, as was their custom. This near approach of the Russians to the imperial frontiers was made a pretext by the court of Vienna for concentrating a body of troops there, and at the same time hints were thrown out of Austria's claims. Not only to this, but some of the adjacent districts. Researches were ordered to be made into old records to establish these pretensions, and Austrian troops seized the territory of Zips, and engineers were employed by the empress to mark out the frontier. They advanced the boundary line along the districts of Sandec, Novitark, and Chorsten, and marked it out with posts furnished with the imperial eagle. Stanislaus had complained of this proceeding in a letter of October 28, 1770, to which the empress returned for answer in January 1771 that she would willingly make an amicable arrangement after peace was established to settle the disputed frontier, but that she was determined to claim her right to the district of Zips, and that for the present it was requisite to pursue the operation of demarcation. The Empress seems to have been instigated not only by the characteristic avidity of Austrian policy, but by jealousies awakened by the near approaches of the Russian troops. Besides, it is a point of some consequence to be remembered though it seems to have escaped the observation of most historians, that she had before her eyes a fearful proof of the danger of an uncertain frontier in the affair of Balta, which was the ostensible cause of the war between Turkey and Russia. This open encroachment on the Polish territory, however, was a fatal precedent. Catherine and Frederick could advance, as excuses for their proceedings, that they were solely intended to restore tranquillity to Poland, and that their possession was only temporary, whereas Teresa's was a permanent seizure. Frederick, therefore, endeavours strenuously in his writings to exonerate his intentions from censure, and shifts the odium of this step on Austria. But whether he is absolutely innocent of the injustice, as he himself calls it, or adds to his guilt by the height of hypocrisy and cant, is a question not very difficult of solution. The three powers could now readily understand each other's designs, but the first communication which took place between them on the subject occurred in September 1770 and January 1771. In the former month, Catherine invited Prince Henry, Frederick's brother, who had before been a personal acquaintance, to her court, and the wily despot of Prussia urged him earnestly to accept the invitation. He reached St. Petersburg in the midst of the festivities and rejoicings for the victories over the Turks, and having, like his brother, abandoned flattery at will, 
he seized the opportunity of loading Catherine with compliments. It would be absurd to suppose that the Empress, masculine as her mind was, could be insensible to this species of attack. She, like all other followers of ambition and conquest, made the applause and admiration, even of the vulgar, the aim of her life, and it can only be affectation in those who pretend to despise the adulation which they so eagerly labor for. Henry was admitted to confidential conferences, and so well did he avail himself of his opportunities and influence that he succeeded in persuading the Empress to accept the mediation of Austria between Turkey and Russia, a commission with which he was charged by his brother. It was in these conferences that the fate of Poland was decided. While Catherine was hesitating about accepting the terms Austria proposed, which were that she should renounce her design upon Moldavia and Wallachia, the news arrived at St. Petersburg that the Austrian troops had taken possession of Zips. Catherine was much astonished at the proceeding, and remarked that if Austria seized the Polish territory, the two other neighboring powers must imitate her example until she desisted. This hint suggested to Henry a mode of removing those objections of Austria which impeded the negotiation. He knew that the court of Vienna was as eager for aggrandizement as Russia, and that all her jealousies would be allayed by a similar accession of territory, that at the same time she would never consent to have the Russians as her neighbors in Moldavia and Wallachia, but would have no objection to their making an equal increase to that immense empire elsewhere. Frederick's consent also must be purchased by an equal allotment. Where, then, he thought, were there three such portions to be found, but where Austria pointed out? Catherine approved of the plan after a few moments' reflection, but mentioned two impediments. First, that when her troops entered Poland, she had solemnly declared that she would maintain the integrity of the kingdom. The next, that Austria would not receive such a proposal from her without suspicion. These difficulties were readily removed, the first by breaking the engagement, and the second by making Frederick the negotiator with the court of Vienna. Frederick's admirers pretend that he was unacquainted with this intrigue, and when the plan was made known to him, opposed it strenuously. But that, on the following day, having reflected on the misfortunes of the Poles, and on the impossibility of re-establishing their liberty, he showed himself more tractable. It is to be hoped that, for the sake of Frederick's remnant of character, that is not true, after the singular manner in which he had evinced his concern for the misfortunes of the Poles, and his solicitude for their liberty in Polish Prussia, such pretensions would have been the very height of hypocrisy. His scruples, at any rate, if any such existed, were soon dispelled and he exerted himself in persuading the court of Vienna to enter into the plot. Austria was but too ready to fall into the design. The conflicting views, indeed, between Maria Theresa, Joseph, and their minister Kaunitz gave rise to some complication of politics and consequent delay. Frederick, strongly as he is said to have disclaimed the plan in the present instance, was now the only party impatient to conclude it. The slowness and irresolution of the Russians, he says in his memoirs, protracted the conclusion of the Treaty of Partition. The negotiation hung chiefly on the possession of the city of Danzig. The Russians pretended that they had guaranteed the liberty of this little republic, but it was in fact the English who, jealous of the Prussians, protected the liberty of this maritime town, and who prompted the Empress of Russia not to consent to the demands of his Prussian majesty. It was requisite, however, for the king to determine, and as it was evident that the master of the Vistula and the port of Danzig would, in time, subject that city, he decided that it was not necessary to stop such an important negotiation, for an advantage which was in fact only deferred. Therefore his majesty relaxed in this demand. After so many obstacles had been removed, this secret contract was signed at St. Petersburg, February 1772. The month of June was fixed on for taking possession, and it was agreed that the Empress Queen should be invited to join the two contracting powers and share in the partition. End of section 31
Section 32 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Natter. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. First Partition of Poland, A.D. 1772, by James Fletcher. Part 2. It now remained to persuade Austria to join the coalition. Joseph and Kaunitz were soon won over, but Maria Theresa's conscience made a longer resistance. The fear of hell, she said, restrained her from seizing another's possessions. It was represented to her, however, that her resistance could not prevent the other two powers from portioning out Poland, but might occasion a war which would cost the valuable lives of many, whereas the peaceable partition would not spill a drop of blood. She was thus, she imagined, placed in a dilemma between two sins, and forgetting the command, Do not evil that good may come, she endeavoured to persuade herself that she was doing her duty in choosing the least. She yielded at length, with the air of some religious devotee who exclaims to her artful seducer, May God forgive you, and at the same time sinks into his arms. The contract was signed between Prussia and Austria on March the 4th, and the definite treaty of partition, which regulated the three portions, was concluded on August 5th, 1772. Russia was to have, by this first partition, the palatinates of Polotsk, Vitebsk, and Mstislav, as far as the rivers of Dvina and Dnieper, more than 3,000 square leagues, Austria had for her share Red Russia, Galicia, and a portion of Podolia and Little Poland, as far as the Vistula, about 2,500 square leagues, and Prussia was to be contended with Polish Prussia, excepting Danzig and Torn with their territory, and part of Great Poland, as far as the river Notec, or Netze, comprising about 900 square leagues. All the rest of the kingdom was to be insured to Stanislaus under the old constitution. All the three powers thought it necessary to publish some defense of their conduct, and in separate pamphlets they attempted to prove that they had legitimate claims on Poland, and that their present violent seizures were only just resumptions of their own territory or equivalent to it. Roulier says that Catherine only made her claim as a just indemnification for the trouble and expense which she had devoted to Poland. This, however, it will be found by referring to her defense, is not the case. She sets forth the great kindness she had shown the Republic by ensuring the election of a Piast, Stanislaus, and uses these remarkable words on this subject. That event was necessary to restore the Polish liberty to its ancient luster, to ensure the elective right of the monarchy, and to destroy foreign influence, which was so rooted in the state and which was the continual source of trouble and contest. She then exclaims against the confederates, Their ambition and cupidity, veiled under the phantom of religion and the defense of their laws, pervade and desolate this vast kingdom without the prospect of any termination of this madness but its entire ruin. She then proceeds with her deduction, endeavoring to prove from old authors that it was not till 1686 that the Polish limits were extended beyond the mouth of the Dvina and the little town of Stoika on the Dnieper, five miles below Kiev. The following is a specimen of the lawyer-like sophistry which the Empress employs to establish her claim to the Russian territory, which remained in the hands of the Poles after the treaty in 1686. The design of such a concession being only to put an end to a bloody war more promptly and by a remedy as violent as a devastation, aussi violent qu'en devastation, to ensure tranquillity of neighborhood between two rival and newly reconciled nations, it necessarily follows that every act on the part of the subjects of the Republic of Poland, contrary to such intention, has ipso facto revived Russia's indisputable and unalienated right to all that extent of territory. It must be observed also that this arrangement about the frontier was only provisional and temporary, since it is expressly said that it shall only remain so until it has been otherwise amicably settled. 
The object was, therefore, to give the nations time to lay aside their inveterate hatred, and to remove immediate causes of dispute between the different subjects, and consequent rupture between the two states. Russia sacrificed for a time the possession of the territory which extends from the fertile town of Stoika to the river Tekmin, and from the right bank of the Dnieper, fifty versts in breadth along the frontier of Poland. There is no idea of cession here on the part of Russia. It is a pledge, gauge, which she advances for the solidity of the peace, which ought to be returned to her when the object of it is effected. This is the only reasonable construction which can be put upon the stipulation until it has been otherwise amicably settled. Russia is not to be a loser because the confusion of the internal affairs of Poland has never allowed that country to come to a definite agreement on this subject, notwithstanding the requests of Russia. It does not demand much acumen to unveil such impudent sophistry as this. The assertion that the arrangement was only provisional and temporary is false, and treaty indeed left the detail of the boundary line to be drawn out by commissioners, as must always be the case in arrangements of this kind, and as was meant to be implied by the words which the Russian minister transforms into until it has been otherwise amicably arranged. Such was the weak manner in which the Russian diplomatists imagined to deceive Europe, their defence, indeed, is as triumphant a proof of the badness of their cause as the most earnest friend of Poland could desire. Our surprise may well be excited at the weakness of the argument, particularly when we remember that Catherine's servants had long been trained in glossing over the basest and most shameful transactions. The ministers of St. Petersburg, said a contemporary writer, are accustomed to appear without blushing at the tribunal of the public in defence of any cause. The death of Peter and the assassination of Prince John inured them to it. Such a work hardly requires refutation. Every sophism and every falsehood is a damning argument against the Russian cause. Truth, in fact, is outraged in every page of the writing, and one striking instance will suffice. Catherine states that the Polish government would never make any arrangement about the frontier, but the fact is that even as late as 1764 commissioners were appointed at the Diet of Coronation for this very purpose, but the Russians refused to nominate theirs. Again in 1766, when Count Rewinski, Polish ambassador to St. Petersburg, made a similar application, he was answered that the affairs of the dissidents must be first settled. The Austrian pretensions were even more elaborately drawn up than those of Russia. In the first place, the district of Zips, the first sacrifice to Russian rapacity, came under consideration. Sigismund, who came to the Hungarian throne in 1387, mortgaged this district to Vladislas II Jagiello, King of Poland, in 1412, for a stipulated sum of money. It is commonly called the Thirteen Towns of Zips, but the district contains sixteen. No reclamation of it had been made till the present time. It had then been in the undisputed possession of Poland nearly 360 years. The chief demur which the Austrians now made to the mortgage was that the King of Hungary was restricted by the Constitution, as expressed in the coronation oath, from alienating any portion of the kingdom. But even this plea, weak as it is under such circumstances, is not available, since it is proved that this article was never made a part of the coronation oath until the accession of Ferdinand I in 1527. The Russian minister endeavoured also to establish the right of his mistress to Galicia and Podolia as Queen of Hungary, and the duchies of Oświęcim and Zator as Queen of Bohemia, what lastly establishes indisputably the ancient claim of Hungary to the provinces in question is that in several seals and documents of the ancient kings of Hungary preserved in our archives, the titles and arms of Galicia are always used. After exhausting the records, and stating that the crown of Hungary has never in any way renounced its rights and pretensions, the author modestly winds up his arguments in the following way. Consequently, after such a long delay, the House of Austria is well authorized in establishing and reclaiming the lawful rights and pretensions of her crowns of Hungary and Bohemia, 
and to obtain satisfaction by the means which she now employs, in the use of which she has exhibited the greatest moderation possible, by confining herself to a very moderate equivalent for her real pretensions to the best provinces of Poland, such as Podolia, etc. Frederick argues his cause on the general principles of civil law. Since then, he says, the crown of Poland cannot prove express sessions, which are the only good titles between sovereigns to confer a legitimate possession of disputed provinces, it will perhaps have recourse to prescription and immemorial possession. We all know the famous dispute among the learned on the question of prescription and natural right, whether it obtains between sovereigns and free nations. The affirmative is founded only on that weak argument that he who for a long time has not made use of his rights is presumed to have abandoned them, a presumption which is at best doubtful and cannot destroy the right and established property of a monarch. Besides, even this presumption altogether vanishes when the superior strength of a usurper has prevented the lawful proprietor from claiming his rights, which has been the case in the present instance. Time alone cannot render a possession just, which has not been so from its origin, and as there is no judge between free nations, no one can decide if the time past is sufficient to establish prescription, or if the presumption of the desertion of rights is sufficiently proved. But even leaving this point undetermined, the prescription which the Republic of Poland could allege in the present case has not any of the qualities which the advocates of prescription require to render it valid between free states. We do not imagine that our readers will coincide with Frederick in the following opinion. We flatter ourselves that when the impartial public has weighed without prejudice all that has just been detailed in this expose, they will not find in the step which His Majesty has taken anything which is not comfortable to justice, to natural right, to the general use of nations, and lastly, to the example which the Poles themselves have given in seizing all these countries by simple matter of fact. We trust also that the Polish nation will eventually recover from its prejudices, that it will acknowledge the enormous injustice which it has done to the House of Brandenburg, and that it will bring itself to repair it by a just and honourable arrangement with which His Majesty will willingly comply sincerely wishing to cultivate the friendship and good fellowship of this illustrious nation and to live with the republic in good union and harmony we have thus given the three monarchs liberty to plead for themselves and no one can rise from the perusal of their defences without feeling additional conviction of their injustice and resentment at their hypocrisy we must own we are almost inclined to interpret Frederick's appeal as a sneering parody on the cant of diplomacy in general. But in whatever light it be viewed, it gives additional insight into the heart and head of that military despot and disciple of Machiavelli. Iniquity almost invariably pays virtue the compliment of attempting to assume her semblance, and the three wholesale plunderers, Russia, Austria and Prussia, therefore determined to give some show of justice to their violent seizure by wringing from their victims a ratification of their claims. But the children of this world, with all their wisdom, cannot always preserve consistency, and cunning as the villain may sometimes be, he will, at some time or other, make the most disgraceful mistakes. By requiring further ratification, the three powers admitted that their anterior claims were not well founded, and common sense ought to have told them that, if the former claims were not just, the latter, depending on the same title, were rendered still less so by aggravated violence. Every show of justice in a villainous action rises up in sterner judgment against the perpetrator, inasmuch as it evinces design, and makes him responsible for the motive. These remarks might be applied to Catherine, Frederick, Maria Teresa, or Joseph, for though they may shield themselves from personal accusation by acting under the vague titles of powers, states, or governments, the evasion is mean and cowardly, for particularly in such despotic governments as theirs, the passions and wills of the rulers are the directors of every political scheme. 
The three powers fixed on April 19, 1773, for the opening of a diet at Warsaw to ratify their claims. Their troops were in possession of all Poland, the capital in particular was strongly invested, and Reviski, Benoit, and Stackelberg, the Austrian, Prussian, and Russian ministers, were on the spot to overrule and direct all the debates. They declared that every deputy who opposed their proposals should be treated as an enemy of his country and of the three powers. Friedrich himself states in his description of this transaction that the deputies were informed, if they continued refractory, that the whole kingdom would be dismembered, but, on the contrary, that if they were submissive, the foreign troops would evacuate by degrees the territory they intended to leave to the Republic. The Diet was to be confederated, that the Poles might be deprived of their last resource, the Liberum Veto. Some few patriots still raised their voices, even in the midst of the united armies of Russia, Austria, and Prussia, and among these Reitan was the most distinguished. He was a Lithuanian by descent, had acted a good part in the Confederacy of Bar, and had earned a character which made the electors of Novogrudek select him for their representative in the present memorable Diet. His colleague was Samuel Korsak, a worthy coadjutor, who did not turn a deaf ear to his father's parting words, My son, I send you to Warsaw accompanied by my oldest domestics, I charge them to bring me your head, if you do not oppose with all your might what is now plotting against your country. Poninski, a creature of the Allied powers, was the marshal of the Diet, appointed by the intervention of the ambassadors, and when the session opened, one of the deputies nominated him, and he was immediately proceeding to take the seat without waiting for the election. But several members rose to protest against this breach of privilege, and Reitan exclaimed, "'Gentlemen, the marshal cannot be thus self-appointed. The whole assembly must choose him. I protest against the nomination of Poninski. Name him who is to be your president.' Some voices instantly shouted, "'Long live the true son of his country, Marshal Reitan!' Poninski retired, adjoining the session to the next day. On the following morning, Poninski again made his appearance, merely to postpone the assembly one day more. When this period arrived, he went to the hall with a guard of foreign soldiers to station some of his faction at the doors and to prevent the entrance of the public. Reitan, Korsak, and their little band of patriots were soon at their posts, when Reitan, perceiving that the people were not allowed to enter, exclaimed, "'Gentlemen, follow me! Poninski shall not be marshal of the Diet today, if I live!' It was already twelve o'clock, and Poninski did not appear, but a messenger arrived to state that he adjourned the meeting. "'We do not acknowledge Poninski for marshal,' replied Reitan, and seeing many of the members about to retire, he placed himself before the door with his arms crossed and attempted to stop the deserters but his exertions proving useless, he threw himself along the doorway, exclaiming, with a wearied but determined voice, Go, go and seal your own eternal ruin, but first trample on the breast which will only beat for honour and liberty. There were now only fifteen members in the hall, and of these but six persevered in their patriotic determination, namely Reitan, Korsak, Dunin, Jerzmanowski, Kozuchowski and Penchkowski. At ten a message arrived from the Russian ambassador, inviting the resolute deputies to a conference at his house. Four of them, among whom was Korsak, accordingly went, and Stackelberg at first addressed them mildly, but finding them resolute began to threaten them with confiscation of their estates. On this Korsak rose and declared, since they wished to seize his possessions, which were already, however, mostly plundered by the Russian armies, there was no occasion for so many preliminaries, and he actually put into his hands a list of all his property, adding, This is all I have to sacrifice to the avarice of the enemies of my country. I know that they can also dispose of my life, but I do not know any despot on earth rich enough to corrupt or powerful enough to intimidate me. Reitan remained still at his post, and the four patriots, on returning, found the doors closed, and lay down without for the night. 
On the following day, the ministers of the three powers repaired to the king's palace, and Stackelberg threatened him with the immediate destruction of his capital unless he gave his sanction to the forced confederation. Stanislaus demanded the advice of his council, but received no reply, and taking their silence for an assent, and not knowing how to evade a direct answer, he yielded to the minister's demands. The corrupt diet held their assembly without the hall, because Reitan was still at his post. Such was their dread of even one patriotic individual. On April 23rd, when Poninski and the Confederates entered, they found Reitan stretched senseless on the floor, in which state he must have lain thirty-six hours. Such was the determination with which he resisted the oppression of his country, and so entirely were all the energies of his mind devoted to the cause that when he learned its fall he lost his reason. The allies began to redouble their threats, and signified to the deputies their intention of portioning out the whole of the kingdom if any more opposition were offered. But, notwithstanding, the Diet continued stormy, and many bold speeches were made. Of all situations, the kings must have been the most perplexing and irksome, but no person was better adapted to act such a part than Stanislaus. He made the most pathetic appeals to his subjects, and frequently spoke in a strain more fit for an unfortunate but patriotic hero than for one who had done nothing but affect a few tears, for we can hardly doubt that they were hypocritical, over the misfortunes which he had brought on his country. The following sentence must have sounded strangely in his mouth. Fesimus quod potuimus, omnia tentavimus, nihil omissimus. Again, on May 10th, he absolutely had the audacity to defend his political conduct, stating that he had always done his duty whenever any business depended on him. On May the 17th, the Diet agreed to Paninski's motion to appoint a commission that, in conjunction with the three ambassadors, should regulate the limits of the four countries, and determine upon the changes in the Polish government. On the 18th, the commissioners were nominated by the king and Poniński. Some small remains of liberty lingered even among the commissioners, and called for fresh threats and violence from the Allied powers. At length they agreed to ratify the Treaty of August V, and establish a permanent council in whom the executive power was to be vested. This council consisted of 40 members, and was divided into four departments, which engrossed every branch of administration. The partition was not fully arranged till 1774, and then Prussia and Austria began to extend their bounds beyond the agreed limits. La Petit vient en mangeant, and these encroachments were a sad augury of future partitions to the Poles. The indifference with which other states regarded this partition was indeed surprising. France, in particular, might have been expected to protest against it, but the imbecility and dotage of Louis XV and the weakness of his minister paid too little attention to the interests of their own nation to be likely to think of others. They made the most frivolous excuses, and even had the meanness to attempt to shift the blame on the shoulders of their ambassador at Vienna, pretending that he amused himself with hunting instead of politics, and had no knowledge of the design of partition until it was consummated. Louis contented himself with saying, with an affection of rage, it would not have happened if Choiseul had been here. Some few patriots in England declaimed on the injustice of the proceeding, but the spirit of the ministry, which was occupied in wrangling with the American colonies about the imposition of taxes, was not likely to be very attentive to the cries of oppressed liberty. The partition is not one of those equivocal acts which seem to vibrate between right and wrong, justice and injustice, and demand the most accurate analysis to ascertain on which side they preponderate. Argument is thrown away on such a subject, for to doubt about the nature of a plain decisive act like this must necessarily proceed from something even worse than uncertainty and scepticism concerning the simple fundamental principles of moral action. A little reflection, however, will not be lost on so memorable a portion of history which opens a wider field for instruction 
than the thousand homilies on the ambition and glory and other commonplaces of Greek and Roman history. Such great political crimes reveal a corresponding system of motives of as black a hue, and even the narrowest experience teaches us that motives are never so well traced as in their results. The corrupt principle, which prompts injustice and deceit in foreign transactions, would operate equally in domestic affairs. And the minister who uses hypocrisy and falsehood in manifestos and treaties would not scruple to do the same in matters of private life. An implicit confidence in enemies like these was one of the amiable crimes for which Sarmatia fell unwept. End of section 32《Section 33 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. — The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. — The Boston Tea Party, A.D. 1773 by george bancroft one of the most famous demonstrations of the purpose of the american colonies to resist what they regarded as the unjust taxation laid upon them by great britain was this unique occurrence in boston harbor everywhere in the colonies the people had begun to go without articles that were subject to taxes they ceased to import goods for clothing and wore homespun it was not easy to find a substitute for tea but various plants and leaves were used instead of it, and store tea became a popular designation of real tea as distinguished from domestic herbs. At last the English government abandoned all taxes except that laid on tea. This the government insisted upon laying as strictly as ever. Ships with cargoes of tea were sent with the expectation that the colonists would pay the tax. What followed upon the arrival of the tea ships at Boston and Charlestown and gave to American history the Boston Tea Party, is fully told in Bancroft's pages. On Sunday, November 28th, the ship Dartmouth appeared in Boston Harbor with 114 chests of the East India Company's tea. To keep the Sabbath strictly was the New England usage, but hours were precious. Let the tea be entered, and it would be beyond the power of the consignees to send it back. The selectmen held one meeting by day and another in the evening, but they sought in vain for consignees who had taken sanctuary in the castle. The committee of correspondence was more efficient. They met also on Sunday and obtained from the Quaker Roch, who owned the Dartmouth, a promise not to enter his ship till Tuesday, and authorized Samuel Adams to invite the committees of the five surrounding towns, Dorchester, Roxbury, Brookline, Cambridge, and Charlestown, with their own townsmen and those of Boston, to hold a mass meeting the next morning. Faneuil Hall could not contain the people that poured in on Monday. The concourse was the largest ever known. A journey to the Old South, Meeting House, Jonathan Williams did not fear to act as moderator, nor Samuel Adams, Hancock Molyneux, and Warren to conduct the business of the meeting. On the motion of Samuel Adams, who entered fully into the question, the assembly composed of upward of 5,000 persons, resolved unanimously that the tea should be sent back to the place from whence it came at all events, and that no duty should be paid on it. The only way to get rid of it, said Young, is to throw it overboard. The consignees asked for time to prepare their answer, and out of great tenderness, the body postponed receiving it the next morning. Meantime, the owner and master of the ship were converted and forced to promise not to land the tea. A watch was also proposed. I, said Hancock, will be one of it, rather than that there should be none, and a party of twenty-five persons, under the orders of Edward Proctor, as its captain, was appointed to guard the tea-ship during the night. On the same day the council, who had been solicited by the governor and the consignees to assume the guardianship of the tea, coupled their refusal with a reference to the declared opinion of both branches of the general court that the tax upon it by Parliament was unconstitutional. The next morning the consignees jointly gave as their answer, It is utterly out of our power to send back the teas, but we now declare to you our readiness to store them until we shall receive further directions from our constituents. 
that is until they could notify the british government the wrath of the meeting was kindling and the sheriff of suffolk entered with a proclamation from the governor warning exhorting and requiring them and each of them there unlawfully assembled forthwith to disperse and to surcease all further unlawful proceedings at their utmost peril the words were received with hisses derision and a unanimous vote not to disperse will it be safe for the consignees to appear in the meeting asked copley and all with one voice responded that they might safely come and return but they refused to appear in the afternoon roch the owner and hall the master of the dartmouth yielding to an irresistible impulse engaged that the tea should be returned as it came without touching land or paying a duty a similar promise was exacted of the owners of the other tea ships whose arrival was daily expected in this way it was thought that the matter would have ended i should be willing to spend my fortune and life itself in so good a cause said hancock and this sentiment was general they all voted to carry their resolutions into effect at the risk of their lives and property every ship owner was forbidden on pain of being deemed an enemy to the country to import or bring as freight any tea from great britain till the unrighteous act taxing it should be repealed and this vote was printed and sent to every seaport in the province and to england six persons were chosen as postwriters to give due notice to the country towns of any attempt to land the tea by force and the committee of correspondence as the executive organ of the meeting took care that a military watch was regularly kept up by volunteers armed with muskets and bayonets who at every half hour in the night regularly passed the word all is well like sentinels in a garrison had they been molested by night the tolling of the bells would have been the signal for a general uprising an account of all that had been done was sent into every town in the province the ships after landing the rest of their cargo could neither be cleared in boston with the tea on board nor be entered in england and on the twentieth day from their arrival would be liable to seizure they find themselves said hutchinson involved in invincible difficulties meantime in private letters he advised to separate boston from the rest of the province and to begin criminal prosecutions against its patriot sons the spirit of the people rose with the emergency two more tea ships which arrived were directed to anchor by the side of the dartmouth at griffin's wharf that one guard might serve for all the people of roxbury on december third voted that they were bound by duty to themselves and posterity to join with boston and other sister towns to preserve and violate the liberties handed down by their ancestors the next day the men of charlestown as if foreseeing that their town was destined to be a holocaust declared themselves ready to risk their lives and fortunes on saturday the fifth the committee of correspondence wrote to portsmouth in new hampshire to providence bristol and newport in rhode island for advice and cooperation on the sixth they entreat new york through mcdougall and sears philadelphia through mifflin and clymer to ensure success by a harmony of sentiment and concurrence in action as for boston itself the twenty days are fast running out the consignees conspire with the revenue officers to throw on the owner and master of the dartmouth the whole burden of landing the tea and will neither agree to receive it nor give up their bill of lading nor pay freight every movement was duly reported and the town became furious as in the time of the stamp act on the ninth there was a vast gathering at newburyport of the inhabitants of that and the neighboring towns and none dissenting they agreed to assist boston even at the hazard of their lives this is not a piece of parade they say but if an occasion should offer a goodly number from among us will hasten to join you on saturday the eleventh roch the owner of the dartmouth was summoned before the boston committee with samuel adams in the chair and asked why he has not kept his engagement to take his vessel and tea back to london within twenty days of its arrival he pleaded that it was out of his power the ship must go was the answer the people of boston and the neighboring towns absolutely require and expect it and they bade him ask for a clearance and pass with proper witnesses of his demand were it mine said the leading merchant i would certainly send it back hutchinson acquainted admiral montague with what was passing on which the active and the kingfisher though they had been laid up for the winter were sent to guard the passages out of the harbor 
at the same time orders were given by the governor to load guns at the castle so that no vessel except coasters might go to sea without a permit he had no thought of what was to happen the wealth of hancock phillips rowe Dinny, and so many other men of property seemed to him a security against violence and he flattered himself that he had increased the perplexities of the committee the decisive day draws nearer and nearer in the morning of monday the thirteenth the committees of five towns are at faneuil hall with that of boston now that danger was really at hand the men of the little town of malden offered their blood and their treasure for that which they once esteemed the mother country had lost the tenderness of a parent and become their great oppressor we trust in god wrote the men of lexington that should the state of our affairs require it we shall be ready to sacrifice our estates and everything dear in life yea and life itself in support of the common cause whole towns in worcester county were on tiptoe to come down go on as you have begun wrote the committee of leicester on the fourteenth and do not suffer any of the teas already come or coming to be landed or pay one farthing of duty you may depend on our aid and assistance when needed the line of policy adopted was if possible to get the tea carried back to london uninjured in the vessel in which it came a meeting of the people on tuesday afternoon directed as it were compelled roch the owner of the dartmouth to apply for a clearance he did so accompanied by kent samuel adams and eight others as witnesses the collector was at his lodgings and refused to answer till the next morning the assemblage on their part adjourned to thursday the sixteenth the last of the twenty days before it would become legal for the revenue officers to take possession of the ship and so land the teas at the castle in the evening the boston committee finished their preparatory meetings after their consultation on monday with the committees of the five towns they had been together that day and the next both morning and evening but during the long and anxious period their journal has only this entry no business transacted matter of record at ten o'clock on the fifteenth roch was escorted by his witnesses to the custom house where the collector and comptroller unequivocally and finally refused to grant his ship clearance till it should be discharged of the teas hutchinson began to clutch at victory for he said it is notorious the ship cannot pass the castle without a permit from me and that i shall refuse on that day the people of fitchburg pledged their word never to be wanting according to their small ability for they had indeed an ambition to be known to the world and to posterity as friends to liberty the men of gloucester also expressed their joy at boston's glorious opposition cried with one voice that no tea subject to a duty should be landed in their town and held themselves ready for the last appeal the morning of thursday december sixteenth seventeen seventy three dawned upon boston a day by far the most momentous in its annals beware little town count the cost and know well if you dare defy the wrath of great britain and if you love exile and poverty and death rather than submission the town of portsmouth held its meeting on that morning and with only six protesting its people adopted the principles of philadelphia appointed their committee of correspondence and resolved to make common cause with the colonies at ten o'clock the people of boston with at least two thousand men from the country assembled in the old south a report was made that roch had been refused a clearance from the collector then said they to him protest immediately against the custom house and apply to the governor for his pass so that your vessel may this very day proceed on her voyage for london the governor had stolen away to his country house at milton bidding roch make all haste the meeting adjourned to three in the afternoon at that hour roch had not returned it was incidentally voted as other towns had already done to abstain totally from the use of tea and every town was advised to appoint its committee of inspection to prevent the detested tea from coming within any of them then since the governor might refuse his pass the momentous question recurred whether it be the sense and determination of this body to abide by their former resolutions with respect to the not suffering the tea to be landed on this question samuel adams and young addressed the meeting which was become far the most numerous ever held in boston embracing seven thousand men 
there was among them a patriot of fervid feeling passionately devoted to the liberty of his country still young his eye bright his cheek glowing with hectic fever he knew that his strength was ebbing the work of vindicating american freedom must be done soon or he will be no party to the great achievement he rises but it is to restrain and being truly brave and truly resolved he speaks the language of moderation shouts and hosannas will not terminate the trials of this day nor popular resolve harangues and acclamations vanquish our foes we must be grossly ignorant of the value of the prize for which we contend of the power combined against us of the inveterate malice and insatiable revenge which actuate our enemies public and private abroad and in our bosom if we hope that we shall end this controversy without the sharpest conflicts let us consider the issue before we advance to those measures which must bring on the most trying and terrible struggle this country ever saw thus spoke the younger quincy now that the hand is to the plough said others there must be no looking back and the whole assembly of seven thousand voted unanimously that the tea should not be landed it had been dark for more than an hour the church in which they met was dimly lighted when a quarter before six roch appeared and satisfied the people by relating that the governor had refused him a pass because his ship was not properly cleared as soon as he had finished his report samuel adams rose and gave the word this meeting can do nothing more to save the country on the instant a shout was heard at the porch a war whoop resounded a body of men forty or fifty in number disguised as indians passed by the door and encouraged by samuel adams hancock and others repaired to griffin's wharf posted guards to prevent the intrusion of spies took possession of the three tea ships and in about three hours three hundred forty chests of tea being the whole quantity that had been imported were emptied into the bay without the least injury to other property all things were conducted with great order decency and perfect submission to government the people around as they looked on were so still that the noise of breaking open the tea chest was plainly heard a delay of a few hours would have placed the tea under the protection of the admiral at the castle after the work was done the town became as still and calm as if it had been holy time the men from the country that very night carried back the great news to their villages the next morning the committee of correspondence appointed samuel adams and four others to draw up a declaration of what had been done they sent paul revere as express with the information to new york and philadelphia the height of joy that sparkled in the eyes and animated the countenances and the hearts of the patriots as they met one another is unimaginable the governor meantime was consulting his books and his lawyers to make out that the resolves of the meeting were treasonable threats were muttered of arrests of executions a transportation of the accused to england while the committee of correspondence pledged themselves to support and vindicate each other and all persons who had shared in their effort the country was united with the town and the colonies with one another more firmly than ever the philadelphians unanimously approved what boston had done new york all impatient at the winds which had driven its tea ship off the coast was resolved on following the example in south carolina the ship with two hundred fifty seven chests of tea arrived on december second the spirit of opposition ran very high but the consignees were persuaded to resign so that though the collector after the twentieth day seized the dutiable article there was no one to vend it or to pay the duty and it perished in the cellars where it was stored late on saturday the twenty fifth news reached philadelphia that its tea ship was at chester it was met four miles below the town where it came to anchor on monday at an hour's notice five thousand men collected in a town meeting at their instance the consignee who came as a passenger resigned and the captain agreed to take his ship and cargo directly back to england and to sail the very next day the ministry had chosen the most effectual measures to unite the colonies the boston committee were already in close correspondence with the other new england colonies with new york and pennsylvania old jealousies were removed and perfect harmony subsisted between all the heart of the king was hardened against them like that of pharaoh and none believed he would relent union therefore was the cry 
a union which should reach from florida to the icy plains of canada no time is to be lost said the boston press a congress or meeting of the american states is indispensable and what the people wills shall be effected samuel adams was in his glory he had led boston to be foremost in duty and cheerfully offer itself as a sacrifice for the liberties of mankind End of section 33section thirty four of the great events by famous historians volume thirteen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by larry wilson the great events by famous historians volume thirteen edited by charles f horn rossiter johnson and john rudd cotton manufacture developed a d seventeen seventy four by thomas f henderson up to the time when james hargreaves an english mechanic invented seventeen sixty seven and brought into use the spinning jenny so named after his wife jenny the spinning of yarn was done altogether by hand richard arkwright added to the jenny of hargreaves a much more useful invention the cotton spinning frame called a water frame because it was driven by water in 1779 samuel crompton invented a still better machine the spinning mule in this he utilized the principles of the jenny and of the frame adding drawing rollers and thereby making a machine that could draw stretch and twist yarn at one operation from this combination of features the mule received its name since the time of crompton it has been greatly improved and the spinning room of a modern cotton mill contains machinery as highly perfected as any that has been invented spinning by machinery is the foundation of the modern textile industry soon after arkwright's invention of the spinning frame edmund cartwright invented the power loom the idea of which came to him while he was visiting arkwright's cotton mills at cromford cartwright took out his first patent in seventeen eighty five within fifty years from that time there were at least one hundred thousand power looms at work in great britain arkwright's invention quickly gave a great impetus to the cotton industry both the cultivation and the manufacture of cotton rapidly increased eli whitney's timely invention of the cotton gin in seventeen ninety three hastened the general introduction of the new manufacturing machinery for more than a century the making of cotton goods has been one of the leading industries of the world the first cotton mill was built by arkwright and hargreaves at nottingham england not long afterward the earliest cotton mill in america was built at beverly massachusetts seventeen eighty seven to aid the new industry the legislature of the state made a grant of five hundred dollars cotton manufacture rapidly increased in new england and there until recently was the center of the american industry within the past few years however many cotton mills have been built in various southern states and the cotton belt regions bid fair soon to become the chief seat of manufacture of its own great staple since eighteen sixty six the cotton supply of the united states has increased from somewhat more than two million bales to about twelve million bales nineteen o four the world's consumption of cotton in nineteen o three was nearly fifteen million bales in the united states the annual consumption in cotton mills is now about four million bales in great britain over three million bales in continental europe about five million bales the number of spindles represented in the world's cotton manufacture in nineteen o three was nearly one hundred twelve million and the united states about twenty two million two hundred forty thousand great britain forty two million two hundred thousand continental europe thirty four million in nineteen o three the exports of cotton manufactures from the united states were valued at over thirty two million dollars nearly one half of its exports went to china the rest being divided among many countries these figures only furnish a slight concrete suggestion of the immense industrial and commercial importance of the invention that arkwright and his associates and successors produced and perfected for mankind what eli whitney did for the cultivation and handling of cotton they have done for the world-wide interests connected with its manufacture the gradual disuse of wigs is assigned by some as the reason that richard arkwright began to turn his attention to mechanical inventions as likely to afford him a new source of income 
but as during his journeys he was brought into constant intercourse with persons engaged in weaving and spinning his inquisitive and strongly practical intelligence would in any case have been naturally led to take a keen interest in inventions which were a constant topic of conversation among the manufacturing population the invention of the fly shuttle by k abury had so greatly increased the demand for yarn that it became difficult to meet it merely by hand labor a machine for carding cotton had been introduced into lancashire about seventeen sixty but until seventeen sixty seven spinning continued to be done wholly with the old-fashioned hand wheel in that year james hargreaves completed his invention of the spinning jenny which was patented in seventeen seventy the thread spun by the jenny was however suitable only for weft and the roving process still required to be performed by hand probably arkwright knew nothing of the experiments of hargreaves when in sixteen sixty seven he asked john kay a clockmaker then residing in warrington to bend him some wires and turn him some pieces of brass shortly afterward arkwright gave up his business at bolton and devoted his whole attention to the perfecting of a contrivance for spinning by rollers after getting k to construct for him certain wooden models which convinced him that the solution of the problem had been accomplished he is said to have applied to mr atherton of warrington to make the spinning machine who from the poverty of arkwright's appearance declined to undertake it he however agreed to lend k a smith and watch toolmaker to do the heavier part of the engine and k undertook to make the clockmaker's part of it arkwright and k then went to preston where with the cooperation of a friend of arkwright john smalley described as a liquor merchant and painter the machine was constructed and set up in the parlor of the house belonging to the free grammar school the room appears to have been chosen for its secluded position being hidden by a garden filled with gooseberry trees but the very secrecy of their operations aroused suspicion and popular superstition at once connected them with some kind of witchcraft or sorcery two old women who lived close by averred that they heard strange noises in it of a humming nature as if the devil were tuning his bagpipes and arkwright and kay were dancing a reel and so much consternation was produced that many were inclined to break open the place the building has since been changed into a public house which is known as the arkwright arms as a proof of the straits to which arkwright was then reduced and the degree to which he had sacrificed his comfort in order to obtain the means of completing his invention it is said that his clothes were in such a ragged state that he declined unless supplied with a new suit to go to record his vote at the preston election in seventeen sixty eight which took place while he was engaged in setting up his machine having thoroughly satisfied himself of the practical value of his invention he removed to nottingham an important seat of the stocking trade whither hargreaves the inventor of the spinning jenny had removed the year previously after his machines had been destroyed by a mob at blackburn arkwright entered into partnership with smalley from preston k continued with him under a bond as a workman and they erected a spinning mill between hockley and woolpack lane a patent being taken out by arkwright for the machine july third seventeen sixty nine the spinning frame of arkwright was the result of inventive power of a higher and rarer order than that necessary to originate the spinning jenny it was much more than a mere development of the old hand wheel it involved the application of a new principle that of spinning by rollers and in the delicate adjustment of its various parts and the nice regulation of the different mechanical forces called into operation so as to make them properly subordinate to the accomplishment of one purpose we have the first adequate examples of those beautiful and intricate mechanical contrivances that have transformed the whole character of the manufacturing industries the spinning frame consisted of four pairs of rollers acting by tooth and pinion the top roller was covered with leather to enable it to take hold of the cotton the lower one fluted longitudinally to let the cotton pass through it by one pair of rollers revolving quicker than another the rove was drawn to the requisite fineness for twisting which was accomplished by spindles or flyers placed in front of each set of rollers the original invention of arkwright has neither been superseded nor substantially modified although it has of course undergone various minor improvements the first spinning mill of arkwright was driven by horses but finding this method too expensive as well as incapable of application 
on a sufficiently large scale, he resolved to use water power, which had already been successfully applied for a similar purpose, notably in the silk mill erected by Thomas Long, on the Derwent at Derby in 1717. In 1771 Arkwright therefore went into partnership with Mr. Reed of Nottingham and Mr. Strutt of Derby, the possessor of patents for the manufacture of ribbed stockings, and erected his spinning frame at Cromford in Derbyshire, in a deep picturesque valley near the Derwent, where he could obtain an easy command of water power from a never failing spring of warm water, which even during the severest frost scarcely ever froze. From the fact that the spinning frame was driven by water, it came to be known as the water frame, since the application of steam it has been known as the throstle. As the yarn it produced was of a much harder and firmer texture than that spun by the jenny, it was specially suited for warp, but the Lancashire manufacturers declined to make use of it. Arkwright and his partners, therefore, wove it at first into stockings, which, on account of the smoothness and equality of the yarn, were greatly superior to those woven from the hand-spun cotton. In 1773 he began to use the thread as warp for the manufacture of calicoes, instead of the linen warp formerly used together with the cotton weft and thus a cloth solely of cotton was for the first time produced in england it met at once with great demand but on account of an act passed in seventeen thirty six for the protection of the woolen manufactures of england against the calicoes of india it was liable to a double duty which at that instance of lancashire manufactures was speedily enforced notwithstanding their strenuous opposition Arkwright, however, in 1774, obtained an act specially exempting from extra duty the new manufacture of stuffs wholly made of raw cotton wool. Up to this time, more than 12,000 pounds had been expended by Arkwright and his partners on machinery, with little or no return. But after the new act, the cotton manufacture created by his energy and genius developed with amazing rapidity until it became the leading industry of the north of England. While struggling against the mingled inertness and active opposition of the manufacturers, Arkwright had all the while been busily engaged in augmenting the capability and efficiency of his machinery, and in 1775 he brought out a patent for a series of adaptations and inventions by means of which the whole process of yarn manufacture, including carding, drawing, roving, and spinning, was performed by a beautifully arranged succession of operations on one machine. With the grant of this patent, every obstacle in the way of a sufficient supply of yarn was overcome, and whatever might happen to Arkwright, the prosperity of the cotton manufacture was guaranteed. Afterward, the invention was adapted for the woolen and worsted trade with equal success. The machine of Arkwright was adapted for roving by means of a revolving cam. For the process of carding, additions and improvements of great ingenuity were affixed to the carding cylinder patented by lewis paul in seventeen forty eight transforming it into an entirely new machine the most important of these were the crank and comb said to have been used by hargreaves but which it is now known that hargreaves stole from arkwright the perpetual revolving cloth called the feeder said to have been used by john lees a quaker of manchester in seventeen seventy eight but which arkwright had undoubtedly used previously at cromford the filleted cards on the second cylinder, which also must have been used by Arkwright in 1778, although a manufacturer named Wood claimed to have first used them in 1774. Indeed, the whole of the complicated self-acting machinery, which without the intervention of hand labor, performed the different processes necessary to change raw cotton into thread suitable for warp, was substantially the invention of Arkwright, and while each separate machine was in itself a remarkable triumph of inventive skill, the construction of the whole series and the adaptation of each to its individual function in the continuous succession of operations must be regarded as an almost unique achievement in the history of invention. End of section 34. Section 35 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Intellectual Revolt of Germany 
A.D. 1775 by Carl Hildebrand. Gerdus Werther Revised Romanticism, A.D. 1775, Carl Hildebrand. The latter half of the 18th century was, throughout Europe, a period of revolt against the old ideas, the outworn bonds of medieval society, in art and literature the older system with its elaborately planned rules and formulas, is technically called classicism, and the outburst against it established romanticism, the spirit of desire, the longing for higher things, an impulse which ruled the intellectual world for generations, and which many critics still believe to be the chief hope for the future. Romanticism found expression more or less impassioned and defiant in every land, but its earliest and strongest impulse is generally regarded as having sprung from Germany. The skeptical, half-cynical rule of Frederick the Great had left men's minds free, and imagination was everywhere aroused. The early culmination of its extravagance is found in the youth of Goethe and Schiller, Germany's two greatest poets, and Goethe's famous novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther became the textbook of the rising generation of romanticists. Bertha kills himself for disappointed love, and the book has been seriously accused of creating an epidemic of suicide in Germany. Hellebrand, writer of the following analysis of the period in the movement, is among the foremost of present-day German authorities upon the subject. Goethe was 26 years old when he accepted, 1775, the invitation of Charles Augustus, and transported to Weimar the tone and allures of the literary bohemia of Strasbourg. There, to the terror of the good burghers of that small residence, to the still greater terror of the microscopic courtiers, began that genial and wild life which he and his august companion led during several years, hunting, riding on horseback, masquerades, private theatricals, satirical verse, improvisation of all sorts, flirtation particularly, filled up day and night to the scandal of all worthy folk, who were utterly at a loss to account for his serene highness, saying, do, to this Frankfurt, Rutoria, the gay dowager duchess, Phelan's firm friend, looked upon these juvenile freaks with a more lenient eye, for she well knew that the fermentation was over, a noble, generous wine would remain. We are playing the devil here, writes Gerda to Merck. We hold together, the Duke and I, and go our own way. Of course, in doing so, we knock against the wicked and also against the good. But we shall succeed, for the gods are evidently on our side. Soon Herda was to join them there, unfortunately not always satisfied with the results of his teaching, about absolute liberty of genius. The whole generation bore with impatience the yoke of the established order, of authority under whatever form, whether the fetters were those of literary convention or social prejudice, of the state or the church. The ego affirmed its absolute, inalienable right to strove to manifest itself according to its caprices and refused to acknowledge any check Individual inspiration was a sacred thing, which reality with its rules and prejudices could only spoil and deflower. Now, according to the temperament of each, they rose violently against society and its laws, or resigned themselves silently to a dire necessity. The one in titanic effort climbed Olympus, heaving Perleon on Aza, the other wiped a furtive tear out of his eye, and aspiring to deliverance, dreamed of an ideal happiness. Sometimes in the same poet, the two dispositions succeed each other. Cover thy sky with vapor and clouds, O Zeus, exclaims Gerdus Prometheus, and practice thy strength on tops of oaks and summits of mountains like the child who beheads thistles. Thou must, nevertheless, leave me my earth and my hut, which thou hast not built, and my hearth, whose flame thou enviest. Is it not my heart, burning with the sacred ardor, which alone has accomplished all? And should I thank thee, who was sleeping whilst I worked? 
the same young man who had put into the mouth of the rebellious titan this haughty and defiant outburst at other moments when he was discouraged and weary of the struggle took refuge within himself like vermin finding his world within himself he spoils and caresses his tender heart like a sickly child all whose caprices we indulge one or the other of those attitudes toward reality the active and the passive were soon taken by the whole youth of the time and just as Schiller's brigands gave birth to a whole series of wild dramas further left in the novels of the time a long line of tears. More than that, even in reality, Karl Moore found imitators who engaged in an open struggle against society, and one met as every corner languishing seawards, whose delicate soul was hurt by the cruel contact of the world. What strikes us most in this morbid sentimentality is the eternal melancholy sighing after nature, Ossian's cloudy sadness and Young's dark nights veil every brow. They fly into the solitudes of the forest in order to dream freely of a less brutal world. They must, indeed, have been very far from nature to seek for it with such avidity. Many, in fact, of these ardent, feverish young men became in the end a prey, some to madness and others to suicide, a species of moral epidemic like that which followed upon the apparent failure of the revolution in 1799 had broken out. The germ of Byronism may be clearly detected already in the worthyism of those times. Exaggerated and overstrained imaginations found insufficient breathing room in the world, and met on all sides with boundaries to their unlimited demands. Hearts, accustomed to follow the dictates of their own inspiration alone, bruised themselves against the sharp angles of reality. The thirst for action which consumed their ardent youth could not be quenched, in fact, in the narrow limits of domestic life. And public life did not exist. Frederick had done great things, but only, like the 300 other German governments, to exclude the youth of the middle classes from active life. Thence the general uneasiness, for there was as much in effect as a cause of this epidemic disease. Above all, it was the expression of a general state of mind. It is this which constitutes its historical importance, while the secret of its lasting value is to be found in its artistic form. Besides, if I may say so without paradox, the disease was but an excess of health, a juvenile crisis, through which Herder, young Goethe, Scheller, and indeed the whole generation had to pass. Oh, exclaims old Goethe fifty years later, in a conversation with young Felix Mendelssohn. Oh, if I could but write a fourth volume of my life, it should be a history of the year 1775, which no one knows or can write better than I. How the nobility, feeling itself outrun by the middle classes, began to do all it could not to be left behind in the race. How liberalism, Jacobinism, and all that deviltry awoke. How a new life began. How we studied and poetized, made love and wasted our time. How we young folk, full of life and activity, but awkward as we could be, scoffed at the aristocratic propensities of Bessus Nikolai and company, in Berlin, who at the time reigned supreme. Ah, yes, that was a spring, when everything was budding and shooting, when more than one tree was yet bare, while others were already full of leaves. All that in the year 1775. Old pedantic Nikolai, at whom he scoffed thus, foresaw, with his prosy common sense, what would happen with all those confounded striplings, as Veland called them, who gave themselves airs as if they were accustomed to play at blind man's buff with Shakespeare. In four or five years, said he, in 1776, this fine enthusiasm will have passed away like smoke. A few drops of spirit will be found in the empty helmet, in a big caput mortarum, in the crucible. This proved true certainly for the great majority, but not so as regards the two curses which then broke loose, and for him who had cut their traces and released them. Gooder indeed modified, or at least cleared up, 
his early views under the influence of a deeper study of nature and the sight of ancient and renaissance art in italy seventeen eighty six to seventeen eighty eight Schiller pulled himself to school under Kant, 1790, and went out of it with a completely altered philosophy. Kant himself became another after, if not in consequence of, the great king's death, 1786. Herder alone remained faithful throughout to the creed he had of himself preached. The way opened by Herder, although partly and temporarily abandoned during the classical period which intervened, was followed again by the third generation of founders of German culture, the so-called Romanticists, and by all the great scholars who, in the first half of this century, revived the historical sciences in Germany. Herder's ideas have, indeed, penetrated our whole thought to such a degree, while his works are so unfinished and disconnected, that it is hardly possible for us to account for the extraordinary effect these ideas and works produced in their day, except by marking the contrast which they present with the then reigning methods and habits, as well as the surprising influence exercised by Herder personally. From his twenty-fifth year, indeed, he was a sovereign. His actual and uncontested sway was not, it is true, prolonged beyond a period of about sixteen years, albeit his name figured to a much later time on the list of living potentates. It is also true that when the seeds thrown by him had grown luxuriantly and were bearing fruit, the soul was almost entirely forgotten or willfully ignored. The generation, however, of the Sturma and Dranga, or, as they were pleased to dominate themselves, the original geniuses looked up to Herder as their leader and prophet. Some of them turned from him later on and went back to the exclusive worship of classical antiquity, but their very manner of doing homage to it bore witness to Herder's influence. The following generation threw itself no less exclusively into the Middle Ages, but what, after all, was it doing, if not following Herder's example, when it raked up Dante's and Calderon's out of the dust in order to confront them with and oppose them, to Virgil's and Racine's, however they might repudiate, nay, even forget, their teacher. His doctrines already pervaded the whole intellectual atmosphere of Germany, and men's minds breathed them in with the very air they inhaled. Today they belong to Europe. Herder, I repeat, is certainly neither a classical nor a finished writer. He has no doubt gone out of fashion, because his style is pompous and diffuse his composition looks so fragmentary, because his reasoning lacks firmness and his erudition solidity. Still, no other German writer of note exercised the important indirect influence which was exercised by Herder. In this I do not allude to Schelling and his philosophy, which received more than one impulse from Herder's ideas, nor to Hegel, who reduced them to a metaphysical system and defended them, with his wonderful dialectics. But F. A. Wolf, when he points out to us in Homer the process of epic poetry, Niebuhr, in revealing to us the growth of Rome, the birth of her religious and national legends, the slow, gradual formation of her marvelous constitution, Savigny, when he proves that the Roman civil law, that masterpiece of human ingenuity, was not the work of a wise legislator, but rather the wisdom of generations and of centuries. Eichhorn, when he wrote the history of German law and created thereby a new branch of historical science, which has proved one of the most fertile. A. W. Schlegel and his school, when they transplanted all the poetry of other nations to Germany by means of imitations which are real wonders of assimilation. Friedrich Schlegel, when, in the wisdom of the Hindus, he opened out that vast field of comparative linguistic science, which Bob and so many others have since cultivated with such success. Alexander von Humboldt and Karl Ritter, when they gave a new life to geography by showing the earth and its growth and development and coherence. W. von Humboldt, when he established the laws of language as well as those of self-government. Jacob Grimm, 
when he brought German philology into existence, while his brother Wilhelm made a science of northern mythology. Still later on, D. F. Strauss, when in the days of our own youth, he placed the myth and the legend with their unconscious origin and growth, not alone in opposition to the idea of deity, intervening to interrupt established order, but also to that of imposture and conscious fraud. Otto Freud Müller, when he proved that Greek mythology, far from containing moral abstractions or historical facts, is the involuntary personification of surrounding nature, subsequently developed by imagination. Max Muller, even, when he creates the new science of comparative mythology, what else are they doing but applying and working on Herder's ideas? And if we turn our eyes to other nations, what else will Burke and Coleridge be constant in A. Thierry, Giesel and A. de Tocqueville? What are Rerun and Taine, Carlyle and Darwin doing, each in his own branch, but applying and developing Herder's two fundamental principles, that of organic evolution and that of the entireness of the individual? For it was Herder who discovered the true spirit of history, and in this sense, it is that Goethe was justified in saying of him, A noble mind, desirous of fathoming man's soul in whatever direction it may shoot forth, searcheth throughout the universe with sound and word, which flow through the lands at a thousand sources and brooks, wanders through the oldest as the newest regions and listens in every zone. He knew how to find his soul wherever it lay hid, wherever robed in grave disguise or lightly clothed in the garb of play, in order to found for the future this lofty rule, humanity be our eternal aim. Among the young literary rebels who, under Herder's guidance, attempted, toward and after 1775, to overthrow all conventionalism, all authority, even all law and rule, in order to put in their stead the absolute self-government of genius, freed from all tutorship, the foremost were the two greatest German poets, Goethe and Schiller, Goethe's Goethe and Werther, Schiller's Brigands and Cabal and Love, were greeted as the promising forerunners of the national literature to come. Their subjects were German and modern, not French or classic. In their plan they affected Shakespearean liberty. In their language they were at once familiar, strong, and original. In their inspiration, they were protests against the social prejudices and political abuses of the time, vehement outbursts of individuality against convention. Now twenty years had passed away when both the revolutionists had become calm and resigned liberal conservatives, who understood and taught that liberty is possible only under the empire of law that the real world with all its limits had a right as well as the inner world, which knows no frontiers, that to be completely free, man must fly into the ideal sphere of art, science, or formless religion, not that they abjured the dreams of their youth. The nucleus of their new creed was contained in their first belief, but it had been developed into a system of social views more in harmony with society and its exigencies of aesthetic opinions were independent of reality and its accidents, of philosophical ideas more speculative and methodical. In other words, Goethe and Schiller never ceased to believe, as they had done at twenty, that all vital creations in nature, as in society, are the result of growth and organic development, not of intentional self-conscious planning, and that individuals on their part act powerfully, only through their nature in its entirety, not through one faculty alone, such as reason or will, separated from instinct, imagination, temperament, passion, etc. Only they came to the conviction that here existed general laws which presided over organic development, and that there was a means of furthering in the individual the harmony between temperament, character, understanding, and imagination without sacrificing one to the others. Hence they shaped for themselves a general view of nature and mankind, society and history, which may not have become the permanent view of the whole nation, but which for a time was predominant, which even now, 
is still held by many, and which in some respects will always be the ideal of the best men in Germany. Even when circumstances have wrought a change in the intellectual and social conditions of their country, so as to necessitate a total transformation and accommodation of those views. We cannot regard it merely as the natural effect of advancing years if Goethe and Schiller modified and cleared their views, if Kant, whose great emancipating act, the critique of pure reason, falls chronologically in the same period, 1781, corrected what seemed to him too absolute in his system, and reconstructed from the basis of the conscience that metaphysical world, which he had destroyed by his analysis of the intellect. The world just then was undergoing profound changes. The great philosopher King had descended to the tomb, 1786, and with him the absolute liberty of thought which had reigned for forty-six years. The French Revolution, after having exalted all generous souls and seemingly confirmed the triumph of liberty and justice, which the generalization had witnessed in America, took a direction and drifted into excesses, which, undeceived, sobered, and saddened even the most hopeful believers. As regards personal circumstances, the Italian journey of Goethe, 1786 to 1788, and his scientific investigations into nature, the study of Kant's new philosophy to which Schiller submitted his undisciplined mind, 1790 and 1791, were the high schools out of which their genius came strengthened and purified, although their aesthetic and moral doctrines did not remain quite unimpaired by them. I shall endeavor to give an idea of this double process and its results at the risk of being still more abstract and dry than before. Man is the last and highest link in nature. His task is to understand what she aims at in him, and then to fulfill her intentions. That view of her is was Goethe's starting point in the formation of his Weltenschungen, or general view of things. All the world, says one of the characters in Wilhelm Meister, lies before us, like a vast quarry before the architect. He does not deserve the name if he does not compose, with those accidental natural materials, an image whose source is in his mind, and if he does not do it with the greatest possible economy, solidity, and perfection. All that we find outside of us, nay, within us, is object matter. But deep within us lives also a power capable of giving an ideal form to this matter. This creative power allows us no rest till we have produced that ideal form in one or the other way, either without us in finished works or in our own life. Here we already have in germ Schiller's idea that life ought to be a work of art. But how do we achieve this task, continually impeded as we are by circumstances and by fellow creatures? who will not always leave us in peace to develop our individual characters in perfect conformity with nature. In our relations with our neighbor, Goethe, like Lessing and Thielen, Kant and Herder, and all the great men of his in the preceding age, in England and France as well as in Germany, recommended absolute toleration, not only of opinions, but also of individualities particularly those in which nature manifests herself undefiled. As to circumstances, which is only another name for fate, he preached and practiced resignation. At every turn of our life, in fact, we meet with limits. Our intelligence has its frontiers which bar its way. Our senses are limited and can only embrace an infinitely small part of nature. Few of our wishes can be fulfilled. Privation and sufferings await us at every moment. Privation is thy lot, privation. That is the eternal song which resounds at every moment, which, our whole life through, each hour sings hoarsely to our ears, laments Faust. What remains then for man? Everything cries to us that we must resign ourselves. There are few men, however, who, conscious of the privations and sufferings in store for them in life, and desirous to avoid the necessity of resigning themselves anew in each particular case, 
have the courage to perform the act of resignation once for all, who say to themselves that there are eternal and necessary laws to which we must submit, and that we had better do it without grumbling, who endeavor to form principles which are not liable to be destroyed, but are rather confirmed by contact with reality. In other words, when man has discovered the laws of nature, both moral and physical, he must accept them as the limits of his actions and desires. He must not wish for eternity of life or inexhaustible capacities of enjoyment, understanding and acting, any more than he wishes for the moon. For rebellion against these laws must needs be an act of impotency as well as of deceptive folly. By resignation, on the contrary, serene resignation, the human soul is purified, but thereby it becomes free of selfish passions and arrives at that intellectual superiority in which the contemplation and understanding of things give sufficient contentment, without making it needful for man to stretch out his hands to take possession of them, a thought which Curtis friend Schiller has magnificently developed in his grand philosophical poems. Optimism and pessimism disappear at once, as well as fatalism. The highest and most refined intellect again accepts the world, as children and ignorant toilers do, as a given necessity. He does not even think the world could be otherwise, and within its limits he not only enjoys and suffers, but also works gaily, trying, like Horace, to subject things to himself, but resigned to submit to them when they are invincible. Thus the simple Hellenic existence, which, contrary to Christianity, but according to nature, accepted the present without ceaselessly thinking of death in another world, and acted in that present, and in the circumstances allotted to each by fate, without wanting to overstep the boundaries of nature, which revive again in our modern world and free us forever from the torment of unaccomplished wishes and vain terrors. The sojourn in Italy, during which Goethe lived outside the struggle for life, outside the competition and contact of physical activity, in the contemplation of nature and art, Develop this view, the spectator's view, which will always be that of the artist and of the thinker, strongly opposed to that of the actor on the stage of human life. Iphigenie, Torcato Tasso, Wilhelm Meister, are the fruits and the interpreters of this conception of the moral world. What ripened and perfected it so, as to raise it into a general view, not only of morality, but also the great philosophical questions which man is called upon to answer, was his study of nature, greatly furthered during his stay in Italy. The problem which lay at the bottom of all the vague longing of his generation for nature, he was to solve. It became his incessant endeavor to understand the coherence and unity of nature. You are forever searching for what is necessary in nature, Schiller wrote to him once, but you search for it by the most difficult way. You take the whole of nature in order to obtain light on the particular case. You look into the totality for the explanation of the individual existence. From the simplest organism, in nature, you ascend step by step to the more complicated and finally construct the most complicated of all, man, out of the materials of the whole of nature. In thus creating man anew under the guidance of nature, you penetrate into his mysterious organism. And indeed, as there is a wonderful harmony with nature in Goethe, the poet and the man, so there is the same harmony in Goethe, the savant and the thinker. Nay, even science he practiced as a poet. As one of the greatest physicists of our day, Helmholtz, has said of him, he did not try to translate nature into abstract conceptions, but takes it as a complete work of art, which must reveal its contents spontaneously to an intelligent observer. Goethe never became a thorough experimentalist. He did not want to extort the secret from nature by pumps and retorts. He waited patiently for a voluntary revelation, i.e., until he could surprise that secret by an intuitive glance 
for it was his conviction that if you live intimately with nature, she will sooner or later disclose her mysteries to you. If you read his songs, his verther, his von der Wattschaffen, you feel that extraordinary intimacy, I'd almost said identification, with nature, present everywhere. Verther's love springs up with the blossom of all nature. He begins to sink and use his self-made tomb, while autumn, the death of nature, is in the fields and woods. So does the moon spread her mellow light over his garden, as the mild eye of a true friend over his destiny. Never was there a poet who humanized nature or naturalized human feeling, if I might say so, to the same degree as Gerda. Now, this same love of nature he brought into his scientific researches. He began his studies of nature early, and he began them as he was to finish them, with geology. Buffon's great views on the revolutions of the earth had made a deep impression upon him, although he was to end as the declared adversary of that volcanism, which we can trace already at the bottom of Buffon's theory. Naturally enough, when we think how uncongenial all violence in society and nature was to him, how he looked everywhere for slow, uninterrupted evolution. From theoretical study, he had early turned to direct observation, and when his administrative functions obliged him to survey the minds of the little dukedom, ample opportunity was offered for positive studies. As early as 1778, in a paper, Granite, he wrote, I do not fear the reproach that a spirit of contradiction draws me from the contemplation of the human heart. This most mobile, most beautiful and fickle part of the creation, to the observation of granite, the oldest, firmest, deepest, most immovable son of nature. For all natural things are in connection with each other. It was his life's task to search for the links of this coherence in order to find that unity which he knew to be in the moral as well as material universe. From those first and most solid beginnings of our existence, he turned to the history of plants and to the anatomy of the animals which cover this crust of the earth. The study of Spinoza confirmed him in the direction thus taken. There I am on and under the mountains, seeking the divine in Hervis et Lepidibus, says he, in Spinoza's own words, and again, pardon me if I like to remain silent when people speak of a divine being, which I can know only in briefest singularibus. This pantheistic view grew stronger and stronger with years, but it became a pantheism very different from that of Paramedes, for whom being and thinking are one, or from that of Giordano Bruno which rests on the analogy of a universal soul with the human soul, or even from that of Spinoza himself, which takes its start from the relations of the physical world with the conceptive world, and of both with the divine one. Goethe's pantheism always tends to discover the cohesion of the members of nature, of which man is one. If once he has discovered this universal unity, where there are no gaps in space nor leaps in time, he need not search further for the divine. It is analogy which helps us to form these intuitive or platonic ideas. It was through analogy that Goethe arrived at his greatest discoveries in natural science, and I only repeat what such men as Johannes Müller, Barr, and Helmholtz have been willing to acknowledge when I say that the poet's eye has been as keen as that of any naturalist. Can't had contended that there might be a superior intelligence, which, contrary to human intelligence, goes from the general to the particular. And Goethe thought, he proved, I might say, that in man, too, some of this divine intelligence can operate and shine, if only in isolated sparks. It was a spark of this kind which, first at Padua on the site of a fan palm tree, then again on the eve of his departure from Palermo, during a walk in the public garden amid the southern vegetation, revealed to him the law of the metamorphosis of plants. He found an analogy between the different parts of the same plant, which seemed to repeat themselves. Unity and evolution were revealed to him at once. 
Three years later, the sight of a half-broken sheep skull, which he found by chance on the sand of the Venetian Lido, taught him that the same law, as he had suspected, applied also to vertebrate animals, and that the skull might be considered as a series of strongly modified vertebrae. He had, in fact, already hinted at the principle, shortly after put forward by Lamarck, and long afterward developed and firmly established by Darwin. He considered the difference in the anatomical structure of animal species as modifications of a type or plant structure, modifications brought about by the difference of life, food, and dwellings. He had discovered, as early as 1786, the interaxillary bone on man, i.e., the remnant of a part which had to be adapted to the exigencies of the changed structure, and proved thereby that there had been a primitive similarity of structure, which had been transformed by development of some parts and atrophy of others. Goethe's sketch of an introduction to comparative anatomy, which he wrote in 1795, urged by A. von Humboldt, has remained, if I may believe those competent to judge, a fundamental stone of modern science, and I may be allowed, as I am unversed in such matters, to invoke the authority of one of the most eminent living physiologists, Helmholtz, who says of Goethe's anatomical essay, that in it the poet teaches, with the greatest clearness and decision, that all differences in the structure of animal species are to be considered as changes of one fundamental type, which have been brought about by fusion, transformation, aggrandizement, diminution, or total annihilation of several parts. This has indeed become, in the present state of comparative anatomy, the leading idea of the science. It has never since been expressed better or more clearly than by Goethe, at after times, have made a few essential modifications. Now the same may be said, I am told, in spite of some differences as to details, of his metamorphosis from plants. I do not mean by this to say that Goethe is the real author of the theory of evolution. There is between him and Mr. Darwin the difference which there is between Vico and Niebuhr, Herder and F. A. Wolf. In the one case we have a fertile hint, and the other a well-established system, worked out by proofs and convincing arguments. Nevertheless, when a man like Johannes Müller sees in Goethe's views the presentiment of a distant ideal of natural history, we may be allowed to see in Goethe one of the fathers of the doctrine of evolution, which, after all, is only an application of Herder's principle of theory to the material world. After having thus gone through the whole series of organisms, from the simplest to the most complicated, Goethe finds that he has laid, as it were, the last crowning stone of the universal pyramid, raised from the materials of the whole quarry of nature, that he has reconstructed man, and here begins a new domain. For after all, for mankind, the highest study best be man himself. The social problems of property, education, marriage, occupied Goethe's mind all his life through, although more particularly in the last thirty years. The relations of man with nature, the question how far he is free from the laws of necessity, are far subject to them as always haunting him. If you read the Wolverwelschaffen, the Wanderjäger, the Second Faust, you will find those grave questions approached from all sides. I shall not, however, enter here into an exposition of Goethe's political, social, and educational views, not only because they mostly belong to a later period, but especially because they have never found a wide echo, nor determined the opinions of an important portion of the nation, nor entered as integrating principles into its lay creed. Not so with the metaphysical conclusion which he reached by this path, and which is somewhat different from the pantheism of his youth inasmuch as he combines with it somewhat of the fundamental ideas of Leibniz, which were also lessons, and which, after all, form a sort of return to Christianity, as understood in its widest sense, in the sense in which it harmonizes with Plato's idealism, thinking as not to be severed from what is thought, nor will from movement. 
Nature, consequently, is God, and God is nature. But in this God nature, man lives as an imperishable monad, capable of going through thousands of metamorphoses, but destined to rest on each stage of this unlimited existence, in full possession of the present, and which he has to expand his whole being by action or enjoyment. This conception of life was not, as you will see, the creation of an imagination longing to pass beyond the conditions of human existence, which is the idealism of the general, but the highest result of the poet's insight into the order of nature. I have said that there was an antagonism between Kant's views and those of Herder and Goethe, and that his antagonism had been ever since sensibly felt in the intellectual history of Germany. Some efforts were made to reconcile them, as, for instance, by Schiller. Sometimes a sort of alliance took place, as in 1813, when the Romanticists, who were quite under the spell of the Herder-Gerder ideas, invoked the aid of the moral energy, which was a special characteristic of Kant's disciples. But the antagonism lives on, not the less even now in the German nation, as the antagonism between Hume and Burke, Locke and Berkeley, Fielding and Richardson, Shakespeare and Milton, nay, between Renaissance and Puritanism, in spite of their apparent death, is still living in the English nation. This difference is, as will happen in this world, much more the difference between two dispositions of mind, character and temperament, than between two opposite theories, or at least the conflicting opinions are much more the result of our moral and intellectual dispositions than of objective observation and abstract argumentation. Germany owes much to the stern, unflinching moral principles of Kant. She owes still more, however, to the serene and large views of Goethe. The misfortune of both ideals is that they cannot and will never be accessible, save to a small elite, that of Kant to a moral, that of Goethe to an intellectual elite. But are not all ideals of an essentially aristocratic nature? The German ideals, however, are so more than others, and the consequence has been a wide gap between the mass of the nation and the minority which has been true to those ideals. The numerical majority, indeed, of the German nation has either remained faithful to the church, though without fanaticism, or has become materialistic and rationalistic. It is a great misfortune for a nation when its greatest writer in his greatest works is only understood by the happy few, and when its greatest moralist preaches a moral which is above the common force of human nature. The only means of union between the nation and the intellectual and moral aristocracy, which has kept guarded that treasure, as well as the only link between these two aristocratic views of life themselves, would be furnished by religion, a religion such as Lessing, Mendelssohn, and above all, Schleiermacher, propounded, such as reigned all over Germany forty or fifty years ago, before party spirit had set to work, and the flattest of rationalisms had again invaded the nation, a religion corresponding for the mass to what Goethe and Kant's philosophy, which is neither materialism nor spiritualism, is for the few a religion based on feeling and intuition, on conscience and reverence, but a religion without dogmas, without ritual, without forms, above all without exclusiveness and without intolerance. I doubt whether this mild and noble spirit, which is by no means indifferentism, will soon revive, as I doubt whether Germany will quickly get over the conflict between the traditional and the rationalistic spirit which mars her public life. Where the two, she will soon reach that political ideal which England realized most fully in the first half of this century, and which consists in a perfect equilibrium between the spirit of tradition and that of rationalism. However, although Kant's lofty and Goethe's deep philosophy of life is now the treasure of a small minority only, it has nonetheless pervaded all the great scientific and literary work done up to the middle of this century. It has presided over the birth of our new state, and the day will certainly come when public opinion in Germany 
or turn away from the tendency of her present literature, science, and politics, a somewhat narrow patriotism, a rather shallow materialism, and a thoroughly false parliamentary regime, and come back to the spirit of the generations to whom, after all, she owes her intellectual, though not perhaps her political and material, civilization. End of section 35《Section 36 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Pestalozzi's Method of Education, A.D. 1775, by George Ripley. Modern education began when Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi established his experimental school at Neuhof in 1775. Comenius had shown the true path of teaching. Pestalozzi was the enthusiast who felt with burning passion the injustice done to the child in the schoolhouses of his day. He protested that the old education was all wrong, and he proved this by his achievements, establishing a little school in his own home at Neuhof, and then in 1800, a larger one at Bergdorf. The Swiss government adopted his ideas. Teachers were sent to learn of him. From Bergdorf is sprung the whole school system of today. As a practical school teacher, Pestalozzi was nevertheless a failure in the end, because he relied on no force but that of personal affection to control his pupils. This divinest of methods succeeded remarkably, while his schools were so small as to bring him into close paternal contact with every child. But at the large institution at Everden, of which he was master in his later years, the method broke down badly. Hence there were not wanting in his own times, critics who pronounced him a failure. They did not see that beside his insistence on love is the way, the reformer had an even more important message for the world. The grand change advocated by Pestalozzi, says Mr. Quick, was a change of object. The main object of the school should not be to teach, but to develop. In this sentence, we have the key to all modern education, though not every teacher even today has digested fully the idea that his duty is less that of stuffing a child full of facts than of developing its character and abilities, encouraging whatever of value exists within itself. The full importance of Pestalozzi's work was recognized by keen intellects even in his own lifetime. Queen Louise, the heroine of Prussia, wished she could fly to Switzerland to grasp Pestalozzi's hand. His system was introduced throughout northern Germany and did wonders with the development of the German people. Today, it is the system of the world. After completing the usual course of education, Pestalozzi continued his studies with a view to engaging in the ministry of the gospel, to which the wishes of his friends as well as his own deep religious feelings had early destined him. This course, however, was soon abandoned. He appeared for the first and only time in the pulpit as a candidate, and then, discouraged by the ill success of the experiment, renounced all aspirations to the sacred office. Soon after, he applied himself to the law, but with a strong predilection for political studies. At this time, his inquiry seemed to have taken the direction which ultimately led him to the discoveries that characterize his name. He saw clearly the great abuses in society which prevailed in his native country, and by dwelling on their enormity his active mind suggested means of relief which could be realized only by a more thorough and judicious education of the people at large. His first publication, issued while a student at law, contained his views on this subject. It was an essay on the bearing which education ought to have upon our respective callings. 
It was not for a mind like Pestalozzi's to behold the evils, which have been brought to his notice without deep and painful emotion. This was experienced to such a degree that he was thrown into a state of morbid excitement, and at length a dangerous illness broke off his ardent researches. Still his mind was not quieted. His thoughts could not be prevented from dwelling on the painful subjects to which he had given his whole soul. Prostrate on the bed of sickness, he continued to indulge himself in dark musings, and his fancy represented the prospects of the future, both for society and for himself, in gloomy colors. The strength of his constitution, however, carried him through the disorder, and from the moment of his recovery, he resolved to follow the leadings of providence, and setting aside all human considerations, to act up to the full extent of his conceptions, and, if possible, to put his views to the test of experience. He now abandoned all his former studies, committed his papers to the flames, and believing that the evils into which society was plunged were mainly owing to a departure from the straight and simple path of nature. To the school of nature he resolved to go. Accordingly, he quitted Zurich and went to Kirschberg in the canton of Bern, where he became an apprentice to a farmer of the name of Tristelli. After qualifying himself under the direction of Tristelli for the charge of a farm, he purchased a tract of wasteland in the neighborhood of Lenzburg in the canton of Bern, on which he erected a dwelling house with suitable buildings and gave it the name of Nuhoff. The work of his hands here was prospered. He soon brought himself into comfortable circumstances and saw his prospects as bright and happy as could be wished. At this time he formed a connection in marriage with Anne Schultes, the daughter of one of the wealthiest merchants in Zurich, a young lady of a refined education and great dignity of character. This marriage, while it increased the happiness of his domestic circle, offered him a new sphere of useful exertions by giving him an interest in flourishing cotton manufactory. After eight years of successful industry at Newhall, Pestalozzi resolved to make a fair trial of the plan, which he had long had at heart, of giving the lower orders such an education as should raise them to a condition more consistent with the capacities of their nature and with the spirit of Christianity, to avoid the interference of others as much as possible and to place the beneficial results of his system in a clearer light. He selected the objects of his experiment from the very dregs of the people. If he found a child who was left in destitute circumstances from the death of his parents, or from their incompetency and vice, he immediately took him home, so that in a short time his house was converted into an asylum in which fifty orphans or pauper children were fed, clothed, and instructed in the different employments from which they might afterward be able to gain a livelihood, and for the exercise of which his farm and the cotton manufactory in which he was a partner afforded an ample opportunity. But this experiment, so happily conceived by Pestalozzi, was destined to prove unsuccessful. He possessed few of the means necessary to bring it to a prosperous issue. His zeal, which led him to undertake the most magnificent enterprises, was not combined with sufficient patience, practical knowledge of human nature, and fixed habits of order and economy to enable him to realize the plans which he proposed, and at length he was obliged to abandon his experiment in despair. It was not, however, altogether useless. He had the satisfaction of knowing that he had rescued more than a hundred children from the degrading influences under which they were born, and planted the seeds of virtue and religion in their hearts. And, in addition to this, his qualifications for the task, to which his life was now devoted, were greatly increased by this insight he had acquired into real nature, and the means of its accomplishment. The results of his experiment at Newhoff, from the time of opening his asylum in 1775 to its close in 1790, I left on record in the valuable works which he published during that interval. The first of these, entitled Leonard and Gertrude, is a popular novel, 
under which form he chose to convey his ideas respecting the condition of the lower classes and the means of their improvement. The success of this work was not what he expected, though universally popular as a novel. There were few who entered into the spirit of the deep wisdom which it contained. This was published in 1781, and in order to draw the attention of its readers to the great object which he had in view, he published another work in the following year, entitled Christopher and Eliza. But this also failed of the purpose for which it was principally intended. Still, Pestalozzi was not discouraged in his attempts to make the public acquainted with his new ideas. He now addressed himself to the literary world, as he had before written expressly for the common people, in a journal published at Basel, under the direction of Iselin, a distinguished philanthropist. He inserted a series of essays entitled Evening Hours of a Hermit, which contained a more systematic account of his mode of instruction and his plans for national improvement. But the current of public thought was in the opposite direction, and little attention could be gained to the plans which he labored to introduce. His success was somewhat better in a weekly publication, which he undertook at the beginning of 1782, under the title of the Swiss Journal. This was continued for one year, and forms two octavo volumes in which a great variety of subjects is discussed, connected with his favorite purpose of national improvement. Soon after the breaking up of his establishment at Newhoff, the country began to be agitated with the excesses of the French Revolution, and Pestalozzi, disappointed in the sanguine hopes which he had formed at the commencement of that event, and disgusted with the scenes of brutality and lawlessness, which it had occasioned, wrote his inquiry into the course of nature and the development of the human species. This work, published in 1797, marks a new epoch in the development of his views. It was written at a moment when his mind was covered with the deepest gloom, and he was almost ready to sink under the struggle between the bright conceptions of improvement which he had formed and the darkness which hung over the existing institutions of society. The following questions which he proposes to himself at the commencement of the work will give some idea of its plan and of the spirit of which it was composed. What am I? What is the human species? What have I done? What is the human species doing? I want to know what the course of my life, such as it has been, has made of me, and I want to know what the cause of life, such as it has been, has made of the human species. I want to know on what ground the volition of the human species and its opinions rest under the circumstances in which it is placed. The following portrait of himself, which he draws at the close of the volume, is highly characteristic of his feelings at this time. Thousands pass away, as nature gave them birth, in the conception of sensual gratification, and they seek no more. Tens of thousands are overwhelmed by the burdens of craft and trade, by the weight of the hammer, the L or the crane, and they are no more. But I know a man who did seek more. The joy of simplicity dwelt in his heart, and he had faith in mankind such as few men have. His soul was made for friendship, love was his element, and fidelity his strongest tie. But he was not made by this world, nor for it and wherever he was placed in it, he was found unfit. And the world that found him thus asked not whether it was his fault or the fault of another, but it bruised him with an iron hammer, as the bricklayers break an old brick to fill up crevices. But though bruised, he yet trusted in mankind more than in himself, and he proposed to himself a great purpose, which to attain he suffered agonies, and learned lessons such as few mortals had learned before. He could not, nor would he, become generally useful, but for his purpose he was more useful than most men are for theirs, and he expected justice at the hands of mankind, whom he still loved with an innocent love. But he found none. Those that made themselves his judges, without further examination, confirmed the former sentence that he was generally and absolutely useless. This was the grain of sand which decided the doubtful balance 
of his wretched destinies. He is no more. Thou mayest know him no more. All that remains of him is the decayed remnants of his destroyed existence. He fell as a fruit that falls before it is ripe, whose blossom has been nipped by the northern gale, or whose core is eaten out by the gnawing worm. Stranger that passes by, refuse not a tear of sympathy. Even in falling, this fruit turned itself toward the trunk, on the branches of which it lingered through the summer, and it whispered to the tree, Verily, even in my death will I nourish thy roots. Stranger that passeth by, spare the perishing fruit, and allow the dust of its corruption to nourish the roots of the tree, on whose branches it lived, sickened, and died. But a brighter day for Pestalozzi was about to dawn. He now became sensible of the great error of his former plans, which made too much account of external circumstances without exerting sufficient influence on the inward nature, which it was his object to elevate. His mind gradually arrived at the important truth, which is the keystone of the system he afterward matured, that the amelioration of outward circumstances will be the effect, but can never be the means, of mental and moral improvement. He had now succeeded in awakening the attention of the Swiss government to the importance of his plans for national education, and was invited to take charge of an asylum for orphans and other destitute children, which should be formed under his own direction and supported at the public expense. The place selected this experiment with Stans, the capital of the canton of Unterwalden, which had been recently burned and depopulated by the French revolutionary troops. A new Ursuline convent, which was then building, was assigned to Pestalozzi as the scene of his future operations. On his arrival there, he found only one apartment finished, a room about 24 feet square, and that unfurnished. The rest of the building was occupied by the carpenters and masons, and even had there been rooms, the want of beds and kitchen furniture would have made them useless. In the meantime, it having been announced that an asylum was to be opened, Crowds of children came forward, some of them orphans, and others without protection or shelter, whom it was impossible under such circumstances to send away. The one room was divided to all manner of purposes. In the day it served as a schoolroom, and at night, furnished with some scanty bedding, was occupied by Pestalozzi with as many of the scholars as it would hold. The remainder were quartered out for the night in some of the neighboring houses, and came to the asylum only in the day. Of course, under such circumstances, anything like order or regularity was out of the question. Even a personal cleanliness was impossible, and this added to the dust occasioned by the workmen, the dampness of the new walls, and the closeness of the atmosphere in a small and crowded apartment made the asylum an unhealthy abode. The character of the children, too, was a great obstacle to Pestalozzi's success. Many of them were the offspring of beggars and outlaws, and had long been inured to wretchedness and vice. Others had seen better days, and, oppressed by disappointment and suffering, had lost all disposition to exert themselves, while a few, who were from the higher classes of society, had been spoiled by indulgence and luxury, and were now conceited, petulant, and full of scornful airs toward their companions. The whole charge of the establishment thus composed evolved upon Pestalozzi, from motives of economy and from the difficulty of procuring suitable assistance. He employed no one but a housekeeper. The burden of this task was increased by the caprice and folly of many of the parents, whose children had been sent to the asylum. They were prejudiced against him as a Protestant, and an agent of the Helvetic government, and spared no complaints which their unreasonableness or ignorance could suggest. Mothers who were in the daily practice of begging from door to door would come on some silly pretext and take away their children because they would be no worse off at home. On Sundays especially, the whole family circle, from parents to the remotest cousin, would assemble in a body at the asylum and after filling the minds of the children with their idle whims, would either take them home or leave them peevish and unhappy. 
Sometimes children were brought to the asylum merely to obtain clothing, which being done, they were soon removed and no reasons given. In many instances, parents required payment for leaving their children to compensate for the loss occasioned by taking them off from their begging. In others, they desired to make an agreement for a certain number of days in the week, in which they could have permission to send them out to beg, and thus being refused, they indignantly declared that they would remove them forthwith, a threat which was not infrequently executed. Such was the character of the materials on which Castellazzi was obliged to commence his great experiments. He was deprived of the ordinary means of instruction and authority, and thus thrown entirely upon his own resources. The inventive genius, for which he was afterward distinguished, was awakened within him, and the spirit of humanity received a fresh impulse. One of the first benefits which he derived from his apparently untoward circumstances was the necessity of resorting to the power of love in the child's heart as the only source of obedience. There was nothing either in the disposition of the parents or the children to aid him in his efforts. On the contrary, a spirit of contempt on the one side and of open hostility on the other placed those obstacles in his way which a less original and energetic mind than his would not have been able to surmount. The usual methods of punishment could not be applied with any success. Accordingly, he discarded them all. He made no attempt to frighten his refractory troop into order and obedience, but used only the instrument of an all-forbearing kindness. Even when obliged to apply coercive methods, he implied them with such a spirit as showed the children that he did not have recourse to them with through anger, but that their use occasioned no less distress to him than to themselves. His mode of instruction partook of the character of his discipline, both were marked with the simplicity of nature. He had none of the ordinary apparatus of teaching, not even books. Himself and his pupils were all. The result was that he abandoned the common artificial systems of instruction and gave his whole attention to the original elements of knowledge which exist in every mind. He taught numbers instead of ciphers, living sounds instead of dead characters, deeds of faith and love instead of abstruse creeds, substances instead of shadows, realities instead of signs. He led the intellect of his children to the discovery of truths which, in the nature of things, they could never understand. In the midst of his children, he forgot that there was any world besides his asylum, and as this circle was a universe to him, so was he to them all in all. From morning till night he was the center of their existence. To him they owed every comfort and every enjoyment, and whatever hardships they had to endure, he was their fellow sufferer. He partook of their meals and slept among them. In the evening he prayed with them before they went to bed, and from his conversation they dropped into the arms of slumber. At the first dawn of day it was his voice that called them to the light of the rising sun and to the praise of the Heavenly Father. All day he stood among them, teaching the ignorant and assisting the helpless, encouraging the weak and admonishing the transgressor. His hand was dearly with them, joined in theirs. His eye, beaming with benevolence, rested on theirs. He wept when they wept, and rejoiced when they rejoiced. He was to them a father, and they were to him as children. Seventy or eighty children, whose dispositions were of the most unpromising character, were converted in a short time into a peaceful and happy family circle. Their tempers were ameliorated, their manners softened, their health improved, and their whole appearance so changed that it was almost impossible to recognize them as the same persons whose haggard and stupid faces had formerly been noticed by every visitor at the asylum. He wished to give to his establishment the character of a family, rather than of a public school. He often related to his pupils narratives of a happy and well-regulated household, and endeavored to awaken their hearts to a sense of the blessings which men may bestow upon each other by the exercise of Christian love. He taught this 
whatever he could by examples taken from real life. Thus, when Altorf, the capital of the canton of Uri, was laid in ashes, having informed them of the event, he suggested the idea of receiving some of the sufferers into the asylum. Hundreds of children, said he, are at this moment wandering about as you were last year, without a home, perhaps without food or clothing. What would you say of applying to the government, which has so kindly provided for you, for leave to receive about twenty of these poor children among you? Oh, yes, exclaimed his pupils. Yes, dear Mr. Pestalozzi, do apply if you please. Nay, my children, replied he, consider it well first. You must know I cannot get as much money as I please for our housekeeping, and if you invite twenty children among us, I shall very likely not get any more for that. You must therefore make up your minds to share your bedding and clothing with them, and to eat less and work more than before. And if you think you cannot do that readily and cheerfully, you had better not invite them. Never mind, said the children, though we should not be so well off ourselves, we should be very glad to have these poor children among us. But the prosperity which Pestalozzi here enjoyed proved to be of short duration, before the expiration of a year from the commencement of his undertaking. Stans was taken by the Austrians, and he was obliged to abandon his experiment at the very moment of its greatest success. This took place in the summer of 1799. He was now exposed to the ridicule of many, who had always derided his plan as visionary and enthusiastic, and to whom he was prevented, by this untimely removal, from giving the evidence of facts and demonstration of its excellence. His disappointment and sufferings on this account were severe. Depressed and unhappy, he retired into the solitude of the Alps, and amid the rocks and the steeps of the Gernicles sought rest for his weary soul, and health for his exhausted nerves, but he could not long remain inactive. The enjoyment of the majestic scenes of nature among which he was placed, and the kindness and sympathy of a friend named Zehender, soon restored him to a cheerful state of mind, and he descended from the mountains, determined to resume his experiment from the point where it had been cut short at stands. The Havelic government at this time made him a grant of about thirty pounds a year, which in 1801 was raised to one hundred, but was stopped entirely in 1803 by the dissolution of the government. This was barely sufficient for his own subsistence, and the small remains of his private fortune were absorbed in the maintenance of his family. In the autumn of 1799, by the advice of his friends, Pestalozzi removed to Bergdorf, an ancient Swiss city in the canton of Bern, where, after several unsatisfactory attempts on a small scale to carry his plans into execution, he at last succeeded by the end of the year in opening an establishment which in 1800 numbered 26 pupils and in 1801 37. About one-third of these were sons of representatives of different cantons in Switzerland, and a part belonged to wealthy tradesmen and agriculturists, and the rest were children of respectable families reduced in their circumstances, who were placed by their friends under the care of Pestalozzi. The expenses of this undertaking were defrayed at first by a loan, which he was afterward enabled, but with great difficulty, to repay but it would have been impossible to continue the institution had not the Helvetic government voted him, in addition to the grant before mentioned, an annual supply of fuel, and a salary of twenty-five pounds each to two of his assistants, Crucy and Boss, who, however generously declined receiving it themselves, but devoted it to the general funds of the institution, from which they received nothing but their board and lodging, at this time, Pestalozzi published a work at the request of his friend Gessner of Zurich under the title of How Gertrude Teaches Her Children, in which he gave a historical account of his experiments up to that period and a general outline of his principles of education. This book made a very favorable impression upon the public. It excited a greater attention to his plans, 
confirmed the hopes of his friends, and convinced many of the soundness of his ideas, who had heretofore regarded them as wild speculations. The current of popularity now set so strong in his favor that he was chosen in 1802 as one of the deputies to Paris, pursuant to a proclamation of the French consul to frame a new constitution for Switzerland. He now made his appearance again as a political writer and presented his views on the state of the country and the means of improving it in a pamphlet entitled View of the Objects to which the Legislature of Switzerland has chiefly to direct its attention. The moderate and liberal opinions expressed in this publication and the wisdom of the proposals which it suggested conciliated the best men of all parties and offended none but the few who cherished an extravagant and bigoted attachment to the ancient order of things. In all his labors, Pestalozzi had a most efficient assistant in his wife, who interested herself especially in cultivating the affections of the younger pupils, while the different branches of domestic economy fell upon his daughter-in-law and an old housekeeper who had been in his family for more than thirty years and lived it rather as a friend than a servant. The domestic arrangements had for their object to form habits of order and to ensure the enjoyment of good health to the children. In the morning, half an hour before six, the signal was given for getting up. Six o'clock found the pupils ready for their first lesson, after which they were assembled for morning prayer. Between this and breakfast, the children had time left them for preparing themselves for the day, and at eight o'clock they were again called to their lessons, which continued with the interruption of five to seven minutes' recreation between every two hours, till twelve o'clock. Half an hour later, dinner was served up, and afterwards the children were allowed to take moderate exercise till half-past two, when the afternoon lessons began, and would continue till half-past four. From half-past four till five, there was another interval of recreation, during which the children had fruit and bread distributed to them. At five, the lessons were resumed till the time of supper at eight o'clock, after which, the evening prayer having been held, they were conducted to bed about nine. The hours of recreation were mostly spent in innocent games on a fine common, situated between the castle and the lake, and crossed in different directions by beautiful avenues of chestnut and poplar trees. On Wednesday and Sunday afternoons, if the weather permitted, excursions of several miles were made through the beautiful scenery of the surrounding country, and some of the children went frequently to bathe in the lake, the borders of which offered in winter fine opportunities for skating. In bad weather, they exhorted to gymnastic exercises in a large hall expressly fitted up for that purpose. This constant attention to regular bodily exercise, together with the excellent climate of Iverdun, and the simplicity of their mode of living, proved so effectual in preserving the health of the children, that illness of any kind made its appearance but very rarely, notwithstanding that the number of pupils amounted at one time to upward of 180. Such was the care bestowed upon physical education in Pestalozzi's establishment and an equal degree of solicitude was evinced for the intellectual and moral well-being of the children. Successful, however, as the purposes of Pestalozzi were at Everdon, the scene which is most intimately associated with his name, and which was the theatre of his brightest and most useful achievements, he was destined again to meet with bitter disappointment, and finally to go down to his grave in sorrow. After a series of embarrassments, occasioned principally by the artifices of an unprincipled and intriguing adventurer among his teachers, and having suffered in his property, his happiness, and to a certain extent in his character, and witnessed the gradual destruction of his establishment, he died at Brugge, in the canton of Basel, on February 17, 1827, at the advanced age of 82 years. End of section 36. End of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 13. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd.